What up, everybody? It's your boy, Evan, one half of MF Pearl. We got the other half sitting behind the camera making sure that we rolling. We got David back there. Hey, everyone. Yes, sir. You know what it is. Every Wednesday, Legends Only in the Building, Volume 2, live at MFHQ. Disclaimer. Live at MFH Cruise. In fact, not recorded live. It's actually a pre recorded program. This episode contains digital explicit content, so feel free to do what you wish with that information. If you're going to be so kind of like follow and subscribe for me, we go the very long window episodes every Wednesday. Now back to the show. Hey, yo, what up, y'all? It's your boy Evan, one half of MF Pearl. Just coming through with one more extra disclaimer for this upcoming conversation, episode 29. The information discussed in this interview is intended for awareness and educational purposes only. The information discussed is not nor is it intended to be considered a psychotherapeutic intervention. Always seek the guidance of your healthcare provider or providers with any questions you may have regarding your mental health. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call or text 988. The 988 Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and best practices for professionals in the United States. Thank y'all, and enjoy the rest of the episode. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Make sure you guys keep showing love to the channels. We're doing great. Just finished up Season 7 of Midnight Sessions. Thank you, Creative El Paso, one time. Yes, sir. Make sure you guys go check it out on the channel, YouTube, MF Pearl. You could also watch the full episodes, mfpearl.com. Um, if you guys want to keep up with all of our latest updates, you can find us on Instagram. That's where we're the most active. And of course, if you are listening to the pod on your favorite streaming platform, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Amazon Music, make sure that you guys show love on those platforms, whether you uh, share it, like it, give it a rating, save it, whatever you could do to show love on those platforms. It helps us grow and we appreciate it very much. But let's get back to the show. Yes, sir. Today, our guest is a friend of ours whom we've been able to meet through the power of MF. Yes, sir. If you go back to those roots. Um, but after maybe about only a couple of encounters, we were uh, early enough, uh, like the, the opportunity to collaborate came early on and we were able to use the creative space that our guest uh, had co-founded and co-created. And it's amazing. A lot of people are familiar with it. It's called The Sanctum. Yes, sir. But uh, through... I guess longer conversations, we get to see some of the commonalities and common interests, but um, where the difference lies, of course, is that his education lies within psychology, and so his uh, his opinions within our conversations are a little bit more formulated versus mine, but I'm always intrigued by what he's had to say thus far. We've had some couple things that uh, we can geek out on, and I think that they tie into big values of life. So immediately after a couple of conversations recently, I, I knew I wanted to have this one here on the on the pod just so we could have some time to sit down because they're always kind of like passive conversations. Now we're going to have it be a little bit more deliberate. But ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, live at the HQ, we welcome Justin Keppel in the building. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How you doing? Doing excellent, Welcome man. to the HQ. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. We're glad to have you. I think there's going to be some great things to talk about. I think um, you've said enough to me to where I'm like just extremely curious right now. So I'm excited to ask uh, some questions and just get to know you a lot better, man. Had a couple of uh, encounters and I feel like, nah, let's get more. So <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Um, can we get a little bit more specific, though, about your psychology background? And I guess um, what like a day-to-day -day might look like. Okay. Yeah, so um, as far as a psychologist, it, it does take a little bit of time to become one, right? Yeah, um, of course. Before coming back to El Paso, I was a, a special operations psychologist in the United States Air Force. And so it's a little different out there. Performance enhancement versus, you know, traditional treatment clinical. Um, but, it, but as far as the day-to-day, -day, you know, here in El Paso, I operate as what's known as a behavioral health consultant. So even though I'm a, I am a licensed psychologist in Texas, um, what I do day-to-day -day now, they've kind of taken me out of the traditional therapy room, and now I'm embedded in a primary care clinic. And so, you know, if you have a cold, physical, that type of thing, you go to your primary care doctor, and now I'm down there. And what that does 
it gives a little more access to individuals that are looking for mental health intervention treatment. Some people don't even recognize it and it's their primary care's uh, um, responsibility to kind of identify it and then send them my way so I can conduct a, a little more thorough assessment, make some recommendations, I can do treatment there um, or refer them up to specialty behavioral health where they go ahead and, and get kind of that more traditional psychotherapy. And so what I do now is, is much more of a hybrid. It's not a full therapeutic hour, usually it's about 25, 30 minutes. Um, but again, the goal is access. And I, you know, that's one of my big soapbox issues as far as a psychologist with, you know, uh, insurance and the medical system the way it is. It's I think one of the limitations that we come across the most in the mental health world is need versus um, resources. Mm -hmm. um, is that why? All right. So then, like with your career, are you pursuing to be as accessible as possible? Hundred percent. I mean, hundred percent. I think um, you know we're no good to anyone unless unless we get access to uh, you know to patients and and individuals that desire and or require a service yeah um you know it's it's a slow process um i you know i've we've talked um a little bit about some ideas i've had or, or new ways innovative ways to try to reach people as, as broadly as possible um but from a, a clinical perspective you know kind of reworking the traditional model i feel with you know pretty much all um, um, industries at this point, especially in a post-COVID world, um, we need to rethink the model and, and, and try something a little more innovative and new um, to get the people what they need. Do you think the accessibility of it is partly due to because of how mental health is, you know, relatively young in terms of like how acknowledged it is? Definitely, uh, it is a very new science, um, and I know a lot of people might disagree with science, especially with uh, the taboos of psychology, the taboos of mental health. A lot of it comes with a, a lack of education and awareness, and I think more so that's the issue, not so much the, the novelty or newness of, of mental health, but just the lack of awareness that people have, um, the types of interventions that are out there. You know, I still get called a head shrinker, you know, shrink, um, which uh, is a very dated term and it is nothing, you know, there's no accuracy to that description. What, is, what, what why is it called that? Where does that come from? Uh, I'm not too sure. I know uh, back in, you know, some of the uh, early days, they believed that, you know, in order to repair or, or resolve any sort of uh, psychological dysfunction, you know, we needed to limit the expansion of, of, you know, the broad range of emotional liability, that type of thing. And so, um, you know, that traditional, you, you go into someone's office, it's usually an old white guy with a <laughs> tweed jacket and, and elbow patches, and, and you just start talking while they stare at you awkwardly. And um, I guess the sensation that people felt was kind of this, like, you know, like they're, they're being compressed or put back together, so to speak. Yeah. So I, I believe that's, that's where it comes from, head shrinking, yeah. And how do you think you oppose it? Do you actually feel like maybe you're trying to expand somebody's maybe behavior? Or um, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so, so I guess the process, right? Process. Um, so what I do, uh, I think the best way to think about it in, in simple sense, my job is to help people be happy, right? Content. Because um, happiness, you know, it's, if we didn't have the ups and downs, it's all about balance. Um, you know, without the downs, there are no ups, so to speak. But mm, when, when it comes to helping people find that contentment or that inner balance, um, it's all about removing the barriers, the obstacles, the, the, the dysfunction that would stop someone from seeking that type of end game that goal that balance that that we all i think innately desire mm -hmm. just because it's probably been one of the most top of mind regarding uh mental health and it, it feels a little bit kind of easy because i know there's a lot of layers to it but if i guess if you're active on you know for me personally i like to do a lot of my reading through twitter mm -hmm. and so uh, there's threads on there and some of them just catch my eye and this one did immediately because it just talked about uh therapy words <laughs> and um I, like I wanted to see your thoughts on it, uh, being in the in the realm of it all, because I don't I don't want to accidentally start confusing the word therapist with psychologist. You, you know okay. what I mean? Okay. Well, let's let's start there. I think that's a good one. Okay. So, um, terms. I mean, you know, they're only in, as important as the perception or meaning behind them, right? And so, 
Um, therapists, counselors, they're usually a master's level um, as far as education. Um, there's certain hour requirements for licensure. Um, as, as a psychologist, you do require a doctorate degree, okay? And beyond just the specific uh, counseling or, or psychotherapy that we provide with people. We also do what's known as a psychological cognitive testing, so actual uh, measurements and mechanisms that take, they're pretty in-depth, they're pretty complex, uh, they take a little more um, know-how to administer and interpret, um, as well as you got to complete that, that good old dissertation, and so you kind of have a, another layer of, of research and, and uh, academic um, um, buy-in, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, so, so that when it comes to therapy, that's kind of the, the, the structure, and then you get into the psychiatric realm, right, which is much more um, medical-based, right? Psychiatrists are typically um, medical doctors or, or DOs, um, and then you have below that, you can either be a psychiatric nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, that type of thing. And again, that realm is more um, medical, right? So medication management, uh, that type of thing. And... Um, the easiest way I, d I describe to my patients, right? You know, uh, psychiatrists treat the brain with medication. I treat the mind with psychotherapy. And I think that's kind of a novel concept to a lot of people, it's separating the brain and the mind. And, you know, that's a lot of time people, I think, adds to the mystery of, of mental health really is the, um, what is the mind, right? It's, it's a process, it's a metaphysical energy uh, essence, if you will that you are, right? We are meat sacks with a little electricity flowing through us. Um, but what kind of comes out the other end that makes us us is this very, very existential and, and metaphysical thing. Ooh. <laughs> Man, I know you got David's gears going right now. Um, how much, I, I, it's a little bit of a left turn, but like how much of uh, that electricity, how much of all that stuff are you reading when you're doing all of your testing versus how much of it are you kind of observing from somebody just behavior? So, so yeah, that's a pretty easy answer. Almost none uh, okay. when it comes to the electricity. So not, not, maybe like yeah. not that, but like the all the neurological stuff that's going on maybe. Yeah, so so we when it comes to the psych testing specifically, it's more how it impacts your behavior, right? And so a very simple test a lot of times is kind of like a memory test, right? Or um, mental manipulation. I'll give you a set of numbers and ask you um, maybe five minutes later to repeat them, but backwards. So again, how your neurology, how your co uh, cognition is functioning, and that's really what it comes to, because, you know, again, I, I, don't, I don't prescribe medication, not in Texas anyway, um, but uh, really that's, that's why I became a, a psychologist versus a psychiatrist, because the mind is what fascinates me. The brain is pretty simple. I mean, we still have a long way to go when it comes to understanding the brain. But I think, yeah, I, I don't know if we'll ever truly understand the mind. And, and that's really what fascinates me. And I do feel like when it comes to, um, you know, treatment and, and therapy, right, you, you can treat the symptoms with medication, but there's no medication that resolves psychological dysfunction. And therapy can resolve psychological dysfunction. <laughs> it's because not fully understanding the mind, what can we confidently understand at the moment through like just your experience of studying it, testing people's um, different, you know, their, their, their different mindsets? Mm -hmm. what, what do we understand about it that is, I mean, easy to misconstrue as, oh, that's the brain working rather than, oh, this is like mind work right now, this, this needs... I think what the, the best way to describe the mind is, is, is truly the notion that humans are perfectly imperfect. I think that's really what it comes down to as far as, as psychology, psychotherapy, right? Um, we, are, we are survivors at our core, and we are magnificent at it, right? And I want to say 85% of, you know, day-to-day -day psychological dysfunction, stress, anxiety, depression, mood dysregulation, um, it's actually the body trying to protect itself, um, but doing so in a very unhelpful way. And that's why we call these things disorders, right? Generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder. We don't call it, you know, diseases. We don't call it illnesses. We don't call it virus or bacteria is because what a disorder is is basically when a, a, a mechanism, a bodily mechanism is working exactly the way it's supposed to, but the result is unhelpful. And so that, again, the, my answer to that would be, 
you know, sometimes we are, we are our own problem. And, and, you know, that's kind of a scary place to be because, you know, we talk about, um, you know, how, how do we, how do we address that? And at the end of the day, we, we are the only ones that can help ourselves. Um, and that's really what I do kind of getting back to your earlier question, as far as our path to happiness is blocked by, you know, barriers of the past, the present, stressors, insecurities, um, fears. And, and my job is to work with each individual one-on-one -on -one and basically help them conquer and, and overcome each hurdle to clear that path to, to contentment and, and balance. Can we simulate how somebody who might have PTSD would begin this process? Like, do you first have to kind of, um, like, ask them, per se? Like, what, what kind of is causing maybe, uh, I don't know. Yeah. How does that process like that look? So, uh, first step always, find yourself a, a good therapist. That is absolutely crucial. Are most people that, by the time they reach you, they've already kind of had this process? No. Usually, I mean, usually it's 50-50. Um, some people have seen a therapist. Some people, they don't know why they're seeing uh, a therapist. They're, they're just listening to their doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, technically not a, not a therapist. I would be a psychologist. Yeah. But um, when it comes to identifying, usually, you know, if, if we lack that awareness or insight and understand, you know, what is going on with us, you know, we just know we don't feel the way we want to feel. And, and that's the first cue. And, and that's really my job initially is, is what we call the assessment phase of, of treatment. And this is an important phase where I conduct uh, a thorough evaluation, assessment, ask the questions I need to ask in order to determine whether or not this person, let's say, um, has experienced a, a traumatic uh, experience that would reach the level of a uh, um, clinical diagnosis of PTSD or if it's a subclinical presentation, you know, a, um, reaction to severe stress would be the subclinical label we would put on that, you know, an acute stress disorder. It goes by many names and there's very specific great criteria uh, for diagnosis, but, but it all starts really with, um, you know, understanding when you don't feel the way you don't want to feel, you know, you gotta, you gotta seek that help and, and that's really where I am. I'm usually the first step to kind of educate them, let them know, and then if, if they require higher level of care, get them set up with that more long-term therapy, medication management, or, you know, if it's not too far along and I feel confident I can treat it within my <clears throat> limited scope of, again, 25 minutes uh, every couple weeks, then, then we go ahead and do so that way. It, it is a fairly novel approach to mental health, mm -hmm. um, but like I said, we're, we're trying to rework that, uh, uh, the dynamic and, and the um, modality. What are some of the most important things that you would like to change? Do you think 25 minutes is enough time? Do you think you would need more time? Or maybe it's two weeks too far apart? I, uh, I don't know how important, you know, specific time or, or frequency yeah. is. I, ca I can say, you know, gold standards, right? And, and I'm always a big believer. I'm an evidence-based guy. You know, I'm a social scientist, so to speak. So I follow the evidence, right? What the, what the research has is shown to be effective. And, you know, these days um, there's a lot of types of therapy, right? I think a common one that people know is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. And that's a pretty large umbrella there. Um, that one is usually, you know, it starts at weekly therapy for about an hour or so. Is that what, like, we usually see on TV? It can be. It can be. Probably what, what most people think, especially in, in, um, in media, like they, they think back to, again, you know, sitting on a couch, that type of thing, listening to the problem. That's that's good old psychoanalysis. That's that's the early days of, of psychology. Um, and, and we've come a long way since. And, and CBT is much more structured. It's much more um, engaging. Right. And and it requires a lot of participation on the, on the patient's part. It can be, um, you know, a lot of a lot of times there's homework right or, or assignments or, or skill building that we utilize in order to you know you come in for an hour of therapy but then you know you have the rest of the week you know if you're not doing anything kind of like you know I, I use a lot of metaphors and, and analogies by the way so you'll, you'll be sick of them by the end of this Heck no. um, <laughs> but it, think of it like working out right okay. I'm your personal trainer mm -hmm. Uh, you want to you want to get jacked? All right, I'll show you how to get jacked. Do do this, you know, put the barbell from your chest and push it up. Simple, but knowing how to do something, having the idea, the notion of it is, is pretty simple, you know. So I can educate my patients on why they are the way they are and what to do to stop it or to resolve it. 
but getting them to get out there and put in the reps to really, you know, quote unquote, build that mental health muscle, so to speak. Um, that's where a lot of the challenge comes uh, in being able to kind of help address, you know, unhelpful habits, um, you know, dysfunctional dynamics, um, changing the environment, the mindset. And, and, and again, it, it all comes from this sense of awareness, knowledge and perception that usually is the first part that, that holds us back. So um, one of the biggest indicators of change, using that analogy, like if you go to the gym, your muscles are growing. Um, doing some of these, um, uh, what do they call like meetings? I guess courses. Session, sessions for, for what? True. Um, like the things that you do every um, those twenty five minute meetings. Yeah, we call them visits because technically visits? we're not allowed to call them sessions because it's not technically. Therapy. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, visits. So visits. Um, I guess in the same vein that you go to the gym and you see your muscles grow. If you go to these visits, you see your behavior change. Is behavior like the thing that you're trying to change? So what, what we do oftentimes, it's called feedback-informed care, right? And so no one knows how you feel better than you do, right? And so um, what we often do is give kind of a, a self-assessment measure, right? A couple questions with kind of rating, okay, rate, rate how, you, how this, you know, how you felt in this domain over the last couple weeks. And, you know, it's, it's not a sophisticated tool by any means, but at the end of the day, no one knows if you're feeling better other than you. And so truly it is a kind of a global aspect, right? Um, are, are your behaviors changing? Is your mindset changing? Is your mood improving? And, and, and really it's kind of a constellation of measures to determine do you feel better or not at the end of the day, right? And, and that's really the goal and, and it's, it's very patient informed. And I, that's something that's changed recently because, you know, they used to rely on, you know, we're doctors, right? We know it all now. Yeah. No, no, no. No one knows the self better than the individual. And our job is to help, you know, again, remove the blockade that has stopped the individual from understanding or um, experiencing their true self, their happiness, their joy, their contentment, that type of thing. Oh, uh, okay. I see. That makes sense. So you're helping them become the fullest version of themselves. Exactly. Mm. Mm. And I'm just a very small tool in that, in that overall toolbox. Okay, yeah. Cool. I'm rem helping them remove the barriers, yeah, for sure. Do you, is there a skill that it takes? Because obviously you need someone who's willing to be honest with themselves. Yeah. Is there a way to tell if someone is or isn't being honest with themselves? I don't know if that's even yeah, possible. Was, yes. yes. So, so don't think of it as simply as like, are they lying, right? Mm. Think of it more like they can't see the truth. Mm. Because again, think barrier, right? We, a lot of times, humans love avoidance. We love avoidance, right? It, it kind of gets back to that very primitive fight or flight. Um, a lot of times, these you know patients that come, they've been dealing with this stuff for a long time, and and you know at, at the foundation again, the core of who we are as survivors are our innate um, re responses to either fight it or flight it. And you know, good luck fighting this stuff on its own. It's 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 pretty you know, uh, trying battle. And, you know, everyone that comes into my office, I've, I've never met a single human that hasn't at least tried to fight it. But avoidance is, you know, it, it tends to work a little, a little easier and a little more effective in the short term. And so a lot of times, you know, this is where we get kind of, you know, denial, right? Those old school kind of defense mechanisms, um, substance abuse, right? It's a great way to avoid uh, feeling the things. And, you know, a good example is, let's say, alcohol, right? Alcohol tends to be a depressant. But, you know, when we, when we drink it, especially like social settings, right, it depresses the part of the brain that controls a lot of these emotional responses. So in, in this particular case, your social inhibition, right, ooh, nervousness, right, depresses that part of the brain. That's why you get more social. And um, when it comes to helping people understand what exists, it's outside of their awareness. And so um, that that's really kind of where you start. I, I never, I never... You know, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist, a cautious optimist at heart. So I, I, it works in the sense of you, you got to trust the patient. They wouldn't have shown up if they didn't want to change. You know, they took time out of their day to come see me. And, um, you know, you, you give them that benefit of the doubt. And, you know, they're, uh, more often than not, yeah, they, they think they're fine or they don't think the problem is as bad as it is. But part of my job is to remove that blockade, remove that lens, that, um, that avoidance that they've utilized to survive uh, and show them, you know, a, a 
this is the problem. And it's kind of a phenomenon we see in treatment. We have different phases of treatment. And typically, especially with um, PTSD, you tend to see an initial elevation in symptoms after the about the second visit or so. Because, you know, you're opening up Pandora's box, you're opening up this can of worms, they come squiggling out real quick. Right, and so that's something you kind of educate them on, and and if you're doing things by the book or you know, um, by the, um, the the techniques and and the uh, theoretical processes, you, you tend to always see that because you know first comes the assessment and awareness, and then once we see the problem for what it is, now you can start addressing it because again a lot of us use avoidance, and you, if you, you can't see the problem, you're not going to have the motivation, the desire, the willingness, or even the the understanding. I need to change this type of thing. That answers your question. Yeah, it, it, there's this. Um, I don't know who, where I heard it from, but there's a, a cool comparison between someone who's drowning and an addict. Is that the person who's drowning knows it? Um, and I feel like you're. So what you're doing is you're showing people that they are drowning, that they need the help. Yeah, yeah, and and it's more. Yeah, addressing that denial, right? It's like, no, 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 I can swim. It's like, all right, well swim from here to here and he's like well i can't and I'm like that's because you're drowning you know like yeah. uh it, you know no one's going to just believe you if you tell them straight up right um you have to kind of you know it's a i don't know a little cliche reference but you know in incept the mind you have to get you know the dream within the dream within the dream and get down to the base and understanding that kind of visceral response and and illuminate for them so they buy into it because without genuine buy in they're not going to come back and see you. And I, I think a lot of times, you know, that's the art of therapy really is, um, you know, because every human that comes in, it's an individual, right? A unique individual, a unique person with a lifetime of experiences, a true culmination of every experience they, that individual has ever had, for better or for worse, has molded that individual to what they are in that moment in the, ther in the therapy room, right? And really the art of therapy, and it's something I pride myself on, is getting to the core of what that is, to understand truly the mechanisms at play that are maintaining those barriers and then teaching them, you know, a multitude of skills, insights, intervention, strategies to be able to break them down and, and hopefully long-term, you know, um, stop the reoccurrence, right? Because that's what we call the maintenance stage. I mean, once we get you good, I want you to stay good. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I can kind of keep you there and then keep you my, my patient for, you know, the rest of your life, it's easy money for me, but that's a little unethical if you ask me. My, my job is to make you your own therapist at the end of the day and, and help you um, mitigate the reoccurrence for sure. Is it always generally, have you seen uh, the course of your career best to massage truth in slowly as opposed to just dumping a bunch of truth at once? Yes, you do have to be tactful because, um, again, a, a little too much and then you create those uh, warning sirens in the patient and then they'll want to avoid and then they won't come back, right? So you can't scare them too quickly. In, in my practice particular, I do tend to be a very in-your-face, a very direct, a very no BS type of provider. I'm not, you know... Um, touchy-feely, like, you know, pat you on the head, it's okay. Like, I mean, yeah, there's a certain amount of empathy that is always required in therapy, but, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in balance overall, and, and sometimes you can find that being too empathetic or too um, careful will just enable the dysfunction and, and, and perpetuate the dysfunction. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are techniques that are assist in that. Uh, it's something called motivational interviewing, also known as just MI. It's, it's an interviewing technique that we utilize that basically performs inception, right? You make the patient believe it's their idea for change while being able to um, um, really, I mean, you, you facilitated that insight, but they, they take that, and, and it's good. It's important because... You know, once, you know, people like to have control, people like to feel like, like they, um, you know, they feel a little more motivated when they feel like it was a genuine um, essence or a genuine realization rather than something just told to them, right? Because, you know, if it, was, if it was that easy, you know, a patient comes in, sits down, they're anxious. All right, I got the perfect solution, man. Well, stop being anxious. All right, you know, 
I'll, I'll send you my bill later. You're welcome. It's not never that easy, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it, telling them and, and showing them uh, is, is, I think, the right way to think about it. It's my job to show them. Um, but you, you do have to do it delicately because, you know, it's, people are especially, you know, a PTSD, very easy to trigger and, and default to your defense mechanisms, your avoidance, and, and then you, you know, it's, you never see them again. And it doesn't, you, you know, does the patient definitely no good? Does you no good? Can't, you know, you can't help someone that doesn't show up. What do, uh, <clears throat> do you look at every barrier that any individual might have? like as a one single thing mm -hmm. or do you kind of categorize them or they, do they become like put in getting put into buckets for easier because uh, a little side thing for the future that we'll talk about is a uh, efficiency like do you try to find ways uh, to kind yes. of like um streamline I, I i you know i think we've talked about it before i believe efficiency to be a true um virtue of life uh so yes obviously you know people don't have unlimited access to money to pay me to do this thing so I want to be as efficient as possible yeah, and so yeah. when it comes to prioritizing absolutely 100% um, you know you get to a point in in the psychological sciences where you understand like hey okay I can kill four birds with one stone type of thing like so with four barriers I know one intervention that kind of can address all of them how do these barriers um, look then what's up how, how do these like how do you see these barriers and like after whenever you're kind of going through individual people um what are the typical kinds like i would i would imagine one of those that gets kind of categories would be like a traumatic past experience mm -hmm. so that, that's a very difficult question to answer and I'll, I'll do my best but um we've all been through things yeah for sure right we've all i mean i, I don't know any i see how any, it becomes difficult yeah so. yeah I, I don't know any human truly that's never experienced a quote trauma right now does it affect them enough to be categorized as a post-traumatic stress disorder that's the question because not everyone responds the same way to a traumatic experience i i in my in with my patients you know a lot of there's a lot of shame behind trauma sometimes and i i i, I say it like this like you know, if I'm walking down the street, I'm a pretty big guy, right? If someone's on a bike and I'm crossing the street and they don't see me and I see them coming, right? I can kind of brace for impact and, you know, take the hit and I'll probably be just fine, right? But if I'm walking down the street looking the other way and someone on a bike comes, you know, something that if I was ready for, I could take the hit, you know? If I'm not looking, you know, it's very easy to break a leg, an arm, a bone. And it's not the trauma so much. It's, it's how the trauma impacts us. And so, okay, it's the bike coming and hitting me. What's the consequences of that? How does that you know, how does that play out in my day to day? Um, and, you know, let's say I break a leg. What do you typically do when you break a leg? You go to the doctor, you get a cast, you get some pain meds temporarily. Of course, we don't mm -hmm. want to perpetuate any opiate ep epidemics, right? Responsible uh, pain management. Um, and then you, you rest, you heal, let the body do what it needs to do, and, and you get back to, you know, normative existence, right? Now, a lot of times, you know, we don't treat mental health that way. We, you know, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm fine. I can handle it. I'll be all right. And you kind of limp around for a little while. And all the while, you, you don't have x-ray vision. You don't know the leg is broken. And, and so it worse. heals. I mean, it, think about it. Yeah, it can get worse. Uh -huh. But the, the body, again, we, we are s fascinating creatures. We fascinating masters of survival. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we are meant to survive. So the body will heal itself. But sometimes if you don't get it adjusted the right way, put the cast on. Um, it won't heal correctly, so it makes it more prone in the future for future breaks, mm. right? It might cause, you know, you to have a, a slight limp, which then gives you chronic hip pain or chronic uh, ankle pain. And, and these things kind of continue to increase and, and really, you know, becomes almost a toxicity, so to speak. One leads to another, leads to another, and it kind of just exponentially grows. And that's really, I guess, to get back to your, you know, uh, question is, you look at the consequences, you look at the impact, and, and this comes into um, what, what we use to diagnose individuals, it's known as the DSM-5, okay? Well, that's, uh, they have a, a newer version, but I was trained on the DSM-5, and it's just a statistical and diagnostic uh, standards of clinical, psychological, and psychiatric practice. And there are very clear guidelines, and, and one of the guidelines is, you know, it's not a disorder until it negatively impacts two different areas of life. So does it work your, your home life, family life, um, social life, occupational life, that type of thing. Um, you know, because, I mean, we can, we can go 
a long ways with this conversation, but think of like uh, sociopaths and used car salesmen or politics, right? It technically wouldn't be a disorder or they wouldn't get a label because that's actually a benefit for them, right? It's, they, you know, there's no negative impact if you're a single person and, you know, you're not you know, going narcissist on your family, right? It's not impacting your family. Um, but that type of wherewithal, it makes you a fantastic manipulator and easy to sell a, a used car pretty easy or manipulate the masses for a political gain, that type of thing. Yeah. So again, there's there's so many, it's, it's the, you know, the minutia, the, the, the constellation of, of barriers that exist, uh, you know, that would take about 10 of these uh, talks to, to even scratch the surface. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's what we go to school for. That's why we yeah. train for so long. That's, you know, what requires that higher level of academic intervention and really separates, you know, trained professionals from like venting to a friend or getting advice from, you know, a, a relative, that type of thing. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels the same, but, it, but it's not. And, you know, nothing against, you know, utilizing your, your support systems. Please, please do. Um, but... There is, we, we have our place and, and we are there to be um, utilized um, appropriately. Yeah. Um, right now when you use narcissists as an example, is narcissism a form of a disorder? Is it considered one? It is. <clears throat> so yeah, it is um, narcissistic personality disorder. Okay. okay. It's a personality disorder. Like a whole and I think even in, in a longer way to get back to your original question, those um, yeah. uh, therapy the, the words, terms. that's a good yeah, one. Yeah. That's a good one. So let's, let's, let's backtrack real quick, and I think that's a good point to get back wanna, on. Maybe have a glass of some whiskey. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Oh. Nar narcissistic personality disorder, but also just the term narcissist. Yeah, so... Thrown around? It gets thrown around. A, a lot of these terms do, and um, you, you mentioned, uh, you, you phrased it in a unique way that's uh, earlier that's escaping me, but um, what you're talking about actually has a name. It's called pop psychology. Um, and this um, pop psychology, you know, it, uh, there are these kind of buzzwords, you know, in, in social media. I see it all the time on, on uh, you know, TikTok and, you know, be on the lookout for the narcissist in your life or, um, you know, don't be gaslit, that type of thing. And, you know, it's rarely is it used accurately. Um, and it is, you know, it is one of those things that I feel is a double-edged sword. Um, when, when it comes to, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, right, there are very evidence-based specific criteria that need to be met. It's not just, you know, someone that's, um, you know, manipulative, someone that's um, selfish, that type of thing that I feel, you know, at least on, on uh, social media, I feel it can get very conflated, mm -hmm. um, the, the, those type of terms. But at the end of the day, you know, I'll, I'll take it uh, because that the other end of it, even though it does conflate and it can kind of, I think we've used the word dilute before, di dilute the impact to maybe like a, a true narcissist versus someone who's acting in a narcissistic way. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the other end any day, man. At least people are talking about it. At least it's out there. At least people are aware of it. Like, you know, if, if you want to label your, you know, parent or significant other as a narcissist, that's fine by me, but at least now they know what to look out for. And, you know, if it's not, if your distress isn't caused by a true narcissist, but just a person in your life who is acting like a narcissist, now you have resources. Now you have that awareness, which I told you is, is crucial, crucial. Yeah. The taboo, it's, 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 it's breaking down. It's, um, people are talking about it. And even though it's not, you know, 100% accurate, I'd rather them be aware of it and, you know, kind of miss the mark slightly rather than not talk about it. And, and so I think it's, it is a double-edged sword in that sense. That's good because there's people who get so, you know, specific within their careers that they become antagonistic to the casual person who's, you know, looking at it all from the outside. A movie, a movie director, an aspiring movie director, or even a very far along one can no longer enjoy a movie now. And then the friends who try to watch a movie with them are just like, God, I can't watch movies. With them. <laughs> so it's like, it's a healthy way, to, I guess, to, you know, appreciate the fact that the people around who don't study this aren't, you know, in it every day involved in in you know trying to get down to it it's okay that they don't fully understand the word it might be throwing it around loosely 
Because uh, I think that's one of the easiest ones to just throw around. It's, uh, the moment someone's inconvenient to you, it's almost as if, like, ah, oh, man, they're being a narcissist. And it's just like, well, I don't know. I've even, um, I've lately seen boundaries are mm. now uh, just an excuse for you to go ahead and be um, neglectful or selfish in a way. Yes. Um, and it's, it's not a surprise that that's the next one to come because... Um, boundaries are the only way to protect yourself from a narcissist. Mm. Uh, and, and so it seems like a natural evolution. And I think it lends to the notion that, all right, maybe we're onto something here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, you know, utilizing any tool appropriately, it's always, that's always the goal, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, people can, you know, be selfish. People can want to, you know, do right by themselves and then themselves only and attribute it to boundaries, sure. But again, I'm thinking of the person that's truly dealing with a narcissist and never heard of boundaries before and now realizing like, hey, I don't have to be a puppet for your emotional satisfaction, which is basically what true narcissism is. Mm -hmm. um, and be able to advocate for those selves, do a little research on what boundaries are and how to enact them and and um, be able to protect themselves from that kind of, you know, parasitic emotional drain that usually comes with being uh, in a narcissistic um, dynamic. But yeah, I think, I mean, narcissistic, toxic. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a big one. What's uh, some other ones? Trauma is a, another big one. There's very specific, excuse me, criterias for what a traumatic event is only to be diagnosed, right? Um, you know, I, I think we can all categorize our own traumas and, and what is traumatic to us is, you know, what's traumatic to me might not be traumatic to you and vice versa. But, you know, if you're looking for the a, a diagnosis of PTSD, there are very specific categories of what a, constitutes a trauma. You know, I, and as helpful as diagnoses are, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I pride myself on balance. There's also, like... I don't really care what we call it. Let's just fix it, right? A lot of times, diagnoses are only for insurance companies. It's like, okay, we're going to give you this much money for this many sessions because that's what the evidence shows is required in order to treat this diagnosis and that diagnosis. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not one for labels. Personally, in my personal life, I, I, it's just confusing, man. I, I'm just me, and that's, that's, that's it. That's the only label I, I try to wear. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of people, labels are important. It gives you clarity and understanding it, it, it can help you um i guess ha have a sense of clarity or control and at least a, a an anchor of what to start doing about it when you have that label um, but also you know labels can be kind of counterproductive as well I mean, you, like you said oh i'm just i'm just a boundary or i'm, I'm just an introvert and so i don't want to hang out with you kind of thing and so you know using the tool the right way is, is at the end of the day is, is what it's all about and you know um, I think overall, the fact that people are talking about it, I think that's the most important thing, regardless of, you know, it, it might be used not for true purposes or clinical purposes, but um, like I said, it's, it's better to, you know, it's, it's better to cast that wide net and get the people that need it rather than making sure only, you know, it's used clinically appropriately. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> uh, let's go into... Let's go into a left turn or a right turn, whichever turn. But uh, how, like, how does having this education, how does having the understanding, but more importantly, just the fascination of wanting to know how, like, just understand more about the mind, how does this background um, translate as a dad? <laughs> um, do you ever feel yourself ever being too preachy or, you know, are you pretty good at doing the dad mode? Well, you know, as insightful as I wish I was I think that's a question better left to my daughter but obviously she's not here so we'll <laughs> we'll uh we'll do our best um no I think I think there's a lot of tools that are very helpful in when it comes to being a parent or in my case a father um I want to say probably the two most important psychological concepts that I really utilize in my you know um day to day as a dad mindfulness and um what we call unconditional positive regard right and 
little background on both unconditional positive regard. Um, you know, it's it's kind of the the notion that you 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 take every person as as good intention, whether they're lying to you or you know. I've worked in with incarcerated populations before, murderers, rapists, um, child abusers. You know, it's it's very easy to let your own biases, your own mindset, get in the way of all that, and so you kind of have to approach with this unconditional positive regard in order to kind of establish this appropriate baseline to work with people. You know, because everyone needs help, right? So, so you're saying it, you're establishing it's it's necessary uh, yeah it, it, well in, in those settings for me it's definitely necessary yeah, yeah. Um, but I think even as a dad right um, again in, in seeking the balance of, of being a dad I don't want to be so restrictive that she doesn't get to live life but as a father my job is to protect her and make sure she doesn't have to experience the horrors of life right mm -hmm. and and so there's a balance and and with that balance a little independence their mistakes are gonna be made right she's gonna mess up she's gonna get in trouble and if you don't have that openness, that un, you know, this this concept of an unconditional positive regard, I think a lot of times, you know, that maybe they start feeling judged or unheard or don't feel comfortable communicating or coming to you when they're in trouble, and and to me that's number one. I don't want anyone else other than you know Papa Bear coming in or coming around and getting her out of a sticky situation. Because I know, you know, I'd, I'd tear down mountains for my kiddo, and, yeah. and, and I know most parents would. And so if, if you are, are highly reactive or, or judgmental, um, and, and that's kind of a, a continuous dynamic or process that's created, you, you close that door, you close that trust um, to, be, to open that communication. And, you know, that, I think that's something that should always be um, a, a priority, and, and that goes nicely into the mindfulness, right? My, I did my dissertation on mindfulness, um, you know, mindfulness, stress, and burnout. Um, you know, the, the textbook definition that I ascribe to is being attuned to the present moment purposefully without judgment. And it's that non-judgment aspect of being here in the moment, right? Because, you know, my kiddo, she's, she's in high school. I was a long distance dad for a lot of her early life. And, you know, uh, like I was saying, like today I had to schedule brunch with her just to hang out with her because, you know, she, she's her own person. She's, her life's coming up. And, when you have that mindfulness aspect, you know, we had two hours this morning and I made sure I, I squeezed all the joy I could out of those two hours because, you know, I will never have that moment again, right? And, you know, um, I think it's crucial to always focus on what you have when you have it, be grateful for it, gratitude. Um, but again, uh, try, try not to judge. Um, and, and that's the hardest part when it comes to mindfulness is, is that lack of judgment. And I think the unconditional positive regard and, and lack or, or non-judgmental approach to, to, to your children is, is paramount because, you know, I sometimes we judge our kids too harshly, but our judgment is blinded by our own insecurities or our own failures. And, you know, I've, I've always, you know, I was, I was an athlete my whole life. Right, my daughter got into athletics, and the last thing I wanted to do was become that that parent or that dad. It's like, you know, you got to give one hundred and ten percent. You know, you <laughs> automatically, yeah, <laughs> automatically and, sounds a certain way. <laughs> yeah, and it um, it it's so you know I, I don't want my daughter to be a tool for my insecurities or my failures to try to rectify that which i feel can happen at times and you know i'm not perfect i'm sure i've i've messed up here and there but um, those two concepts, the mindfulness and unconditional positive regard, allows us to have really difficult conversations and there have been difficult things that she has to come and talk to me about and i it's something i pride ourselves on is <clears throat> our our ability to communicate and you know being a, a dad to a a uh, teenage daughter, it's, it's, it can, I'm sure it's awkward for her. I'm sure it's challenging for her, but you know, my goal is just to keep her safe and teach her about life and, and make sure she has the tools when she's ready to start her own life and, and go out on her own to live the best, you know, existence to the best of her ability. And that's, um, so yeah, I, I, I do definitely think about these psychological concepts. Uh, you mentioned being preachy, uh, yeah. I do catch myself lecturing her on things that probably go over most, uh, you know, teenagers' heads. Um, but I, I can assure you she's the most uh, psychologically attuned uh, teenager in El Paso right now. <laughs> I'd put money on that. Um, and I, I try definitely to, um, to, to limit myself. But also it's, I mean, there's a lot of things that we didn't learn, that we weren't teach, that we should have been. 
um, very early on. And mindfulness, I, for instance? Mindfulness is a big one, but even, even more basic, and I'll, I'll get to that once I, I wrap up this, but, um, you know, I think even in the psych world, um, you know, I, I don't get, I don't, I guess I don't, I'm not too hard on myself when, it, when I find myself preaching because psych, uh, the psychological sciences, the psychological history, they're kind of dominated by uh, pretty, you know, b badass father-daughter teams. Mm -hmm. So Sigmund Freud and his daughter Anna Freud, um, she took a lot of what he did and actually brought it into kind of, you know, the not the 21st century, it's, uh, but uh, definitely modernized it. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, that was psychoanalysis back in the day. And then um, it was Aaron Beck and, and Judith Beck, his daughter, that, that revolutionized cognitive behavioral therapy. And like I said, that's kind of the gold standard these days. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't mind myself and my daughter being, you know, the third wave of powerhouse father-daughter uh, psych psychological uh, team, you know. She's shown interest of studying it or following it in the field of it? Yes, but I'm pretty sure she's doing it just so I stop asking. <laughs> I don't care what she does as long as she's happy. I, I tell her that all the time. And, and that's truly the important thing. But um, getting back to what you mentioned earlier, the things we should have learned. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off on a little uh, soapbox yeah, uh, tangent do. real quick. Because, you know, this, you know, I, I think we've talked about before, like in a perfect world, you know, if, if my career ended up exactly the way I wanted it to, right, I, I get to be the, the Bill Nye, the science guy yes. of the psychological mm -hmm. world. So Dr. Keppel, the psych guy, you know, uh, that's, that's my dream, right? And, mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that because um, you mentioned earlier, like kind of changing the dynamic of mental health. It's absolutely necessary. And I feel what Bill Nye did for science when I was growing up is, is made it accessible, understandable, kind of limited the, the fear or the hesitation that comes with, whoa, science, I'm not a science person, you know, uh, you know, that's for the smart people. I'm like, no, like, you know, I'm not smarter than anyone else. Um, you know, it, it just comes from a, you know, how digestible it is, right? Yeah. Um, and what, what I feel that we should be teaching kids, you know, um, I, I often, almost always with every patient, I'll use kind of a, a comparison between dental health and mental health. And I know it sounds silly, but we are all taught very early on um, how to brush, how to floss, mouthwash, and, and, you know, it's like Sesame Street. They have little fun songs about brushing your teeth, right? Yeah. And so we, we've kind of mastered the dental health domain, right? You brush, floss, mouthwash multiple times a day, every day, every day of your life as a means of prevention, proaction in addressing, you know, the, the dental ailments or the, you can call it dental dysfunction that arises. But, you know, I get patients coming in. Um, you know, I think the younger generation is a little more open and um, a little better at seeking treatment. But, you know, I get 30, 40, 50, 60 years, year old patients sometimes it's their first venture in, and I, I, I tell them, like, when was the last time you brushed your mental health teeth? And they kind of look at me, like, very confused and, you know, not really understanding the question. I'm like, you know, you're a 60-year-old person that's never brushed your mental health teeth before. There's, there's going to be some stuff. We've got to get in there and clean. And what I feel like the uh, Bill Nye approach can do is teach the basics. I have my big three, right, uh, what we call diaphragmatic breathing, okay? There is nothing more critical to any human's mental health than taking the time to learn how to regulate your respiratory rate because it's truly the only way to access that more primitive part of your brain. It's a, brain, a part of your brain called your amygdala and it controls your, your stress response. This, this is a, a very primitive part of the brain, part of the autonomic nervous system, auto, automatic, you have no control over it. With, through deep breathing, you are able to access that autonomic part of the brain because normally, you know, we've, we've been talking for a minute, we've both been breathing without really thinking about it. We do it automatically. But through this, um, this kind of learned, intentional, regimented exercise, you are learning how to regulate this untouchable part of your nervous system. And, you know, I'm teaching this to a 60-year-old for the first time, but what difference could have been made if you learn this at three years old, four years old? Yeah. Kind of like what, imagine you invested at 18 instead of waiting till 35. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Like and exponential growth, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And, and, you know, there are things, you know, behavioral, physical activity, um, and, and even journaling. Journaling is such an important thing because, you know, um, being able to write things down, you, you, our minds work very fast. They're supercomputers. And 
a lot of times if you're not taking the time to write it down, you're not showing your brain how to slow down so you can process that information to get it from your brain to your hand on paper, which, you know, our hands don't write as fast as, um, as our brains think. And, and what that does is an exercise in teaching you kind of this cognitive control, this, this uh, allowing you to process these um, automatic and unhelpful thoughts that, that lead to the emotional responses that, that it, it's what I do, it's what I treat. And so, you know, being able to teach people this, and this is, I mean, this is the pinnacle, right? This is the very tip of the iceberg. Um, and there's so much more that, you know, we can do on a proactive, uh, in a proactive place, a preventative mechanism, just like we treat dental health. As long as you're brushing, brushing flossing, and mouthwashing, there's a pretty good chance you can avoid the dentist most of your life, right? But even then, we don't go to the dentist usually, you know, when we need to. We have our annual checkup or whatever, right? And, and same thing with, you know, we gotta, you got to treat us the way you treat your dentists. You know, go in for a tune-up every once in a while. Don't wait until, you know, your, your engine's blown, you know, when you start hearing that squeak or you, something doesn't feel right in the, in the transmission. Take it right away and instead of waiting, you know, in, in the military we called it right of boom or left of boom. Get on the left of the problem, but before the, it's an actual problem and treat it from a, a preventative rather than a reactive approach. And, and I think, I mean, I, I'm already kind of like in this wonderland utopian existence where I think, you know, we could do the world a lot of good. I mean, all the human race a lot of good teaching these things early on, reinforcing them early on. Um, but, you know, it, it hasn't happened yet, and, and so I hope one day to kind of, you know, be in a position where I can do that, you know, once my kiddo's in college and my student loans are paid off and, <laughs> yeah. you know, all, all that good stuff, because she's number one priority, of course, and that's usually the biggest limitation right now is, you know, I got I to gotta stick with the good old nine to five and, you know, insurance and all that stuff, make sure she's taken care of, but um, it's definitely something I hope to pursue in the, in the not the distant future, but you know, as uh, recent as maybe the next uh, three to four years. Yeah, it's once, coming up. Yeah, once, once things align. It also gives you time to kind of shape it out a little bit better, too. But I wanted to ask regarding the breathing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would assume, I'm hoping it makes sense. I'd be surprised if you weren't familiar with uh, Wim Hof. I am. Can you explain that a little bit to me? And is that something that you mm -hmm. support? Or are there other breathing exercises that are, like, more realistic? Is it not a realistic? It's pretty realistic, right? It's just... A deep breathing exercise? Yes. So uh, my knowledge in Wim Hof specifically is not grand. I've seen a few documentaries. I've read up on him a little bit. I love the guy. I think what he does and the passion he has behind it is great. Um, as far as the research, I know he has some research out there. I don't know. You know, I don't want to comment one way or the other because I'm not as informed in, in the specifics of the research. Um, and so a lot of the stuff he does, he does a lot of like cold, you know, uh, or cold immersion and, and, and that type of thing. Um, so what I will say is what I'm talking about is, is very different from Wim Hof. Um, and I'll kind of leave it at that because I don't, you know, uh, I, I, it's not my area. But when it comes to what I'm talking about is diaphragmatic breathing, yeah, that's, that's, that should be the cornerstone of all stress management mental health regimens and you know, a, a quick caveat to anyone listening. You know, I am a psychologist, but I'm not your psychologist. Uh, so don't, you know, anything we talk about on this podcast, mm -hmm. um, you know, before before utilizing it or, or, or trying it out, please consult with your professional, uh, me your, your medical or psychological professional before doing that. Got to gotta plug that in, man. One of our first medical disclaimers. <laughs> Growth. Yes, sir. Growth. No, it's, uh, but it's necessary because, again, this is all educational at this point. And, and again, that's what, yeah. I think this platform offers is, is that awareness and, you know, a, a quick Google search. There's no, there's no mystery behind it, man. It's, it's in three to four seconds, out three to four seconds, you know, mm -hmm. focusing on belly breathing rather than shoulder breathing, that type of thing. And, and, and again, it, it's so simple that usually it gets overlooked. And I think that's why, you know, every time I tell my patient that's going to be our first stop, I, always I get the eye roll. I was like, all right, all right, well, let me explain it a little more deeply. And I get, my, get on my whiteboard and I draw my little diagrams. I got all these illustrations. I'm a visual learner. So unfortunately, I'm also a visual teacher. Yeah. Uh, my patients do have to suffer through my, my illustrations. But, but usually by the end of our first visit, I, I got the buy-in. They're willing to try it out. You know, I, I start them off with kind of a scheduled, um, you know, routine. And, you know, most of the time they come back and they, they tried. And that's all I ask. Mm -hmm. you know? And then we, f we find the barrier. Okay, what, what was the barrier for you to uh, to do it as many times as I said, or as many times as you were supposed to. 
and then we go from there. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think, you know, the awareness and there's, I think more capable people out there. Um, again, if you're interested in like the mindfulness or the, the deep breathing, John Kabat-Zinn, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, he, you know, I met him very early on in my career and he kind of, um, really, really motivated me to seek mindfulness, um, and, you know, do a quick YouTube or Google, Google search on him. And, uh, trust me, he's, he's the guy you want to learn, uh, mindfulness and deep breathing from, not me. <laughs> Um, for the, for the, uh, diaphragm, mm -hmm. uh, do you know if it has any kind of, like, can you also apply this to just, um, like after a work or after a run, you just practice these same breaths and it does also have the same effect because it's like scientifically lowering your, your heart rate. I know that we so, all, yeah, no. So, so what, what it's called is, breath. um, so again, I'll get a little nerdy with you real quick. So what you're talking about is um, sympathetic arousal. That's the elevation of these things. Elevated heart rate, respiratory rate, adrenaline secretion, perspiration, yeah. muscle tension. That's your fight or flight activating. That's your body preparing, you know, to take on those big bad saber tooth tigers, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and, and, you know, we can engage that. And we do typically engage that um, when, we, when we work out. And so your body is active, right? That sympathetic arousal um, activates. Um, and then what, what you're talking about on the, on the back end is parasympathetic decline, okay? And that's where, yeah, so yes, to answer your question, yes. You can use deep breathing to lower um, or to, to um, extinguish this, this elevation um, very effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in, in, in exercise, you don't really need it as much because, I mean, it's a natural up and you got to, that's why we have cool down, right? You, you cool down after a workout to allow your body to naturally go down. Um, this would be better off used, you know, if, if you're on a verge of a panic attack or, or an emotional elevation and you, where you don't want to ruin a relationship by, you know, flipping a table or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's where, you know, these can be used. And again, it's better to use them proactively because you got to have practice and flex those mental health muscles a couple ah, times before absolutely. you get in the game and show them what you got, you know? Working out would be right of the boom. Uh, well, well, no, actually. So yeah, practice would be left of boom. And then you have the, uh, like, let's say you practice for the championship game. You don't go into the championship game cold turkey, right? You, yeah. you, you, you got to be uh, prepared and ready. So exercise is a good thing, man. It's uh, <laughs> uh, all about it. And, and exercise is the, you know, what we consider behavioral activation. It's a great way to get out all that pent-up survival energy. You know, you know it is stress, but we, we call it, you know, collected uh, sympathetic arousal. Um, but um, it's, it's another one, you know, the breathing will help stop the production of stress and then the behavioral activation or physical activity is the easiest way to burn it off. Mm -hmm. um, along with um, mindfulness and breathing, would you also kind of circling back to what we nerded about last at our last uh, encounter, uh, maybe not so much talking about the importance of like efficiency but maybe the importance of habits it, like does that fall under the things that you you believe that we should be getting taught early on do you think we have already some sort of deliberate teachings of habits i don't i don't think we do another very great question um difficult to answer but i will do my best we are creatures of habit we are ingrained with habit we cannot escape habit what we what I think you're touching on is the habits that you have, are they helpful or unhelpful? And so what, what, yes, it's, um, I mean, we, we are, we don't like the unknown. I think that's the most primitive fear of the human condition, right? And so habits come from a place of consistency, uh, reassurance, um, control, right? And, and, and we are programmed, right? You know, you learn to ride a bike one time and, and you've developed muscle memory, right? That kind of habitual me mechanical movement that really hard to forget how to do it, right? Um, but there are, there are other things, right? Um, our body is always creating these habits. And so if you feed it this kind of unhelpful process, and a lot of times these, these processes are created, these habits are created subconsciously out of our awareness just like, you know, things that you're, you know, we call it modeling in psychology. You, you, you watch your parents and how they interact with their world, which then teaches you how to interact with your world. But guess what? You have an anxious parent. Guess what you're learning? You're, you're learning the norm of 
how to address the world this way, which causes anxiety in your parents, which is likely going to be, you know, if you follow those same habits, is going to create anxiety in you. Um, and so, you know, the importance, I, I, I don't think there's anything more. Eh. It's definitely top three. We'll, we'll, we'll call it top three. Um, It'll be in your Bill Nye teachings? A hundred percent, man. <laughs> um, it's actually that you mentioned that because, yeah, I've kind of started my list of things. And it's, it's I, I, if I recall correctly, I think it is number three on my li- like third episode. Um, Habits. Because, you know, um, kind of like getting back to the therapy, right? You assess, you identify, and then you treat. Okay, you assess for the problem, you figure out the problem. Now you got to do something about it. You got to elicit change. Right. And a lot of this change, like rarely does anyone come into my office and is purposefully anxious, purposefully depressed. Trust me, like, no human wants this. Um, but if it was as easy as telling them, you know, don't be anxious or, you know, if it was as easy as them just deciding to not be depressed. Right. Um, they probably would have done that a long time ago. And so when we get into the, the, the habit formation and change game, it is, uh, again, a very important phase of treatment because now we have to deconstruct that unhelpful habit and reconstruct a more helpful habit. And you'll notice I use the terms helpful and unhelpful often because I hate bad good. I hate positive and negative. That is kind of, it's a very like dichotomous, dualistic. eh. And, And it can lead to even bigger problems. I know this is a bit of a tangent, but you know, let's say you have a bad habit. Okay. Right, and you try to replace it with a good habit. Okay, cool. I mean, I believe you've done you know part of the job of saying, okay, this is this is a bad thing. But now you know habits are not easy to change, and so every time you don't follow through with the good habit and go back to the bad habit, this label of bad transcends just the habit. We start thinking, oh, I can't change. Maybe I'm bad. Maybe my situation is bad. Maybe I'm unworthy. I'm a bad person oh, yeah. that doesn't it's deserve. It's got an unwanted snowball. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And 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 it really comes. You know, it, it it's very discouraging. I think it's the major. What would you call it? Deflator of motivation. And um, you know, we call it the just world fallacy, which is a little more in the ph- uh, philosophy realm. But you know. If you're good, you'll get good things. If you're bad, you'll get bad things. You and I both know that's not true, but that doesn't stop us from feeling it sometimes. And so when when you have this kind of dualistic or um, dichotomous um, approach, uh, I, I feel like at times can can do more good, or excuse me, more uh, more unhelpfulness than <laughs> helpfulness. Um, and so getting back to the the habits, so. I think if, if anyone, you know, if anyone wants to better understand the nature of change and habit, uh, you guys open to book recommendations on this? Yeah? Yes, okay. Uh, it's called Switch. Okay. okay. Um, I, I read it and was required to read. It was part of my curriculum um, during my residency. And it's, I think the subtitle is How to Change When Change is Hard. And uh, it's these two brothers, I think, I, they know their last name is Heath. I, I forget their first names. Um, but these guys are kind of titans in their industry. I think one of them's a Stanford, like, business professor or something like that. They're, they, they know what they're talking about. And they, um, they utilize this, this pretty fun concept of what's known as the elephant rider path model. And it kind of plays into what I was talking about earlier, kind of um, that primal stress response and this logical kind of, um, hu- hu- I, the way I phrase it to my patients, human brain, animal brain, and they're just kind of in constant battle always. Well, um, what, what this book kind of touches on is, you know, the, this is the writer, the logical, the human sitting on top of the elephant, right? And the elephant is that animal brain, desire, pleasure, uh, you know, so this is logic, this is primitive desire, um, this, all this wants to do is, is avoid pain and seek pleasure. This, you know, I know I need to wake up on time. I know I need to get to the gym five days a week. I know I probably should eat the salad instead of the chocolate cake. What, you know, you, you name it. And, and the problem is because this part of the brain, the, the elephant in the example, is it's so primitive. It's so powerful. That's where emotions come from. It will always win. Like if there's a fork in the road and the rider wants to go left, there's nothing that human sitting on top 
can do to truly make the elephant go left if the elephant truly desires to go right. And so you can think, you know, a salad at the end of one, you know, on, on the left side and a, a chocolate cake on the right side. And when it comes to behavior change, right, they say never rely on motivation because motivation is fleeting. Motivation, sometimes it's there, sometimes it isn't, right? And a lot of times, uh, I think this is a quote from the book because I use it a lot in, in my practice as well, is a lot of times what looks like laziness is just exhaustion. And I think a lot of times we conflate a lack of motivation with laziness when in reality it's just true exhaustion. And like everything we deal with day to day, uh, I mean, the world the way it is right now, we've got a lot on our plates. And I think, you know, psychologically, emotionally, physically, you know, we, our batteries are drained pretty constantly. So in order to help the rider get to where it knows it should go, what they say is change your environment. Focus on that path, right? So elephant rider path. The rider isn't going to be able to make the elephant go where he wants to go unless he gets off the elephant and changes the path so the elef that path the elephant originally wanted to go down, yeah, that, that's too narrow or that's not, that's not achievable. It's much easier to go down this path to the salad, even though the reward at the end is much more immediately gratifying. Oh, yeah. And so uh, an example I use this with my patients oftentimes, you know, let's say um, they want to get to the gym and they have a problem getting to the gym. Okay, very simple. Um, and I kind of walk them through, okay, tell me a little bit about your daily routine. Okay, well, I get out of work, you know, I go home. Um, I kind of sit on the couch for, you know, five, ten minutes to kind of unwind. And then, you know, that's when I'm, you know, let's say my partner gets home and they can watch the kids while I go, while I get to the gym. And I'm like, okay. And so what do you end up doing, you know, instead of going to the gym? Well, I just end up sitting on my couch the rest of the night. And I'm like, okay, fair. So how, you know, if, if, let's say in a perfect world you had the motivation to get off the couch and then make it to the gym, walk me step by step of the process of how. Okay, well, I'd get up off the couch, I'd go upstairs, I'd uh, go, to my, you know, go to my room, I'd, I'd change clothes, I'd get into my gym clothes, I'd grab my gym bag, I'd get back in the car, I'd drive to the gym, and then I'd work out for you know, an hour, let's say, okay. And I was like, all right, well, let's see. You're already exactly where you want to be, right? Because once you get home from the gym, what are you going to go do? Get back on the couch. So you're already in that place you want to be. You don't have any motivation, desire to be anywhere else other than that couch, which is very, you know, for that elephant, exactly where it wants to be nice and comfortable, that pleasure that it seeks, right? So the path to the gym is not only less desirable, you have to jump several hurdles to get over there. So that path is pretty, you know, unrealistic to get there. And so what we would do is come up with an action plan to rearrange that path. So we come up with, you know what? Tomorrow, I want you to get your gym bag. I want you to take your gym clothes to work, okay? Now, I want you, before you leave work, go to, the, go to the bathroom or if you have an office, you know, close the door. Change into your work clothes at work. Now, drive directly to the gym on your way home. And then, you know, I'll, I'll tell them, if you just drive to the gym, you don't even have to go in. That's fine. We can start small. The fact that you just drove to the gym first, great. But you're already there. You're already in the clothes. That path to the gym is much easier than going all the way home after all that trouble of changing into your clothes. And, you know, as silly as it sounds, that's what this book shows is changing the path. Not, don't, don't rely on, on trying to get, convince the elephant to go where it doesn't want to go. Make the path, you know, uh, much more accessible and easier to get to the place where the rider wants to go. And there's all these tricks, these environmental, you know, um, um, we call them prosthetics, behavioral prosthetics that you can use in order to manipulate your environment to make that path easier. And it, and it starts very small, right? Sometimes I have patients that <clears throat> the goal will just be to take their clothes to work. You have to, smart, to start that small because, again, with habits, you can't reach for the stars. You're not Superman. You can't leap tall buildings in a single bound, right? You have to start you go into the stairwell, take one step, and then a next step and a next step. And, and when it comes to habit formations, you, the, the more micro you start, 
the better off you're going to be because we, then we get, you know, that inertia, right? You, you build off that victory and a next victory and you get that exponential growth. And so, you know, the first week, the goal is to take your gym bag with your clothes to work every day. Great. You met that goal now, actually change into them in the next week, then actually change in them and drive to the gym and then actually get into the gym. And then we can build on that. And the research shows it's the most effective way to change. And, and it's something I use almost ex, you know, exclusively in our change game because, again, that's one of the barriers. That's an environmental barrier, right? And who would have mm, there you thought go. that? Mm -hmm. like, who would have thought that, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just doing my normal routine, which is you know, your natural habit of going home first, which is fine. It's not a bad habit, but it's a very unhelpful habit because your goal is, you know, it, it conflicts with your goal. It, it impedes and becomes a barrier to you achieving your goal. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just like hearing it all get explained and then just seeing how all that gets kind of summed up into the realistic nature of somebody just kind of blaming it all on, like you said, like, oh, man, I'm just so lazy. And, and it, nothing not breaks that. my heart more. It's just like, no, I mean, because the actions you can take oh, yeah. that, that are way more defeatable than the idea of being lazy. And I, I think you're touching on a very important um, uh, tangent that we should explore, if, if you're willing. Um, of course. You, you said action, right? So action, control. And I tell my patients this always, right? There is externally, you know, outside of us, we cannot control anything. The world is the world. The chaos is the chaos, right? And, and this Armor kind of... And the land. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, you know, kind of going, going back a little bit to that um, just world fallacy, right? You can be, you know, a lot of times, you can be the perfect child and yet your parents can still resent you. They can still call you names. They can still punish you, right? You can be the perfect employee. You can not get that promotion, right? Yeah. And you cannot control external. Cannot control. And so it's one of those things that I, I work my patients. It's one of those things we have to recognize, acknowledge, and then accept. We have zero control over the world externally. Now the goal, the trick is, the, the fun part, <clears throat> we always can control how we respond to the outside world, to what happens to us. We always have control how we respond. Rarely do we have the tools to allow us to respond appropriately. And then again, that's part of my job is to break down the barriers and teach the tools to be able to facilitate that. But that's where things get really exciting because now you become a master of your reality. You get to create your reality. As long as you have the tools, the know-how, um, it doesn't matter. You don't need control over the outside world when you learn how to control the inside world. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I think in, in essence, that's uh, something that a lot of people um, maybe don't recognize and, and gets back to, you know, the action. Yeah. No one's going to come and save us, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, their medications can help. But, there, again, there is no medication that magically removes depression because depression, again, it's not, it's not a virus. So yeah, you, know, it, it you like can't. <laughs> suppresses the emotions, but they're going to come back because none of the actions that permanently take them away. We'll get back to that. Yeah, it's not technically what the medications Sorry, do. I no, it's cool. No, 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 it's cool. But, but, but again, it's an, a common misconception that people have about psychotropics, and, and we, mm. can, we can save that for a little later. But um, when, when it comes to action, yes, mm. no one is going to save us we have to learn how to save ourselves. And that's why I kind of talked about earlier, you know, I don't want you to be dependent on, as me as a psychologist, if I just, you know, teach you enough to feel better, but now I'm your access to feeling better and you continue to need me months, years, I'm not doing you a service. I'm making you, uh, you know, I'm your crutch. I'm, I'm complicit in this dysfunction. My job is to teach you how to, learn these skills, utilize these skills effectively to, re you know, remove these barriers for yourself and have the insight to understand all that. Um, and so, yeah, when it, when it comes to action, you know, control, and, and you mentioned the, uh, the uh, f farmer, um, what was the, the farmer? And the land. The land, yes, yes. Except Explain a little of that, yeah. Cause yeah, it was, just a mo it was just two different productivity models that I had saw. I liked that how they worded it. It just sounded so smart to say productivity models. But it was either farmer and land versus the employee and the boss model. And both of them are just, you know, you and yourself. So uh, the boss and employee model is all based around, um, 
I guess, processes in life or like parts of life that, you know, uh, reward and punishment exists and it has an effect versus the farmer in the land where um, I suppose you could reward the land by watering it and whatnot, but that's kind of just cheating. The The idea is that um, you kind of just go as a farmer, you just go as the land goes and you have to adapt to what the land's providing and you have to go based off that, which is kind of how life in a way or majority of the way is. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's my quick summary of the farmer and the land. But, you know, the whole idea is just that like, you know, I guess finding the balance of, because it isn't really one or the other. It's not just Boston employee and it's not just farmer and land. It, it's life is an entire balance of that and being able to discern which is which is helpful because knowing what you can control and what you can't control is like i think one of the biggest um components of emotional control and being able to handle that that animal side of the brain the elephant Mm -hmm. yeah i i like i prefer the term uh, uh management or regulation control Again, there's no such thing. No, okay. no such thing as control. Management. Yeah, regulation. yeah, no. Um, and again, you know, words. Stabilize. Words are important, right? I mean, there's a oh, whole, yeah. there's a whole um, school of thought, um, constructivism, right? That we construct our reality based on the words we have, which are subsidiaries or a product of the thoughts that we have. And, and really, that's it. You know, that's the basic tenet of cognitive behavioral therapy. How you perceive your world is going to result in how your body responds to it. So, right, if you, I mean, if you have these rose-colored glasses on, right, everything's going to be rainbows and butterflies, which is great most of the time. And this is where, you know, another um, pop psychology term um, or kind of in, in the pop psychology world is, you know, uh, positive, positive affirmations, right? <laughs> well, that's where you get into what's something called toxic positivity, right? You can't, you know, I, I think there's a funny meme out there. It's one of my favorites. It's like this dog in a burning, like, building, and he's like, this is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, no, it's not fine. It's not fine at all. You, you should find a fire extinguisher or at least get out and do something. And, and, and that's the thing. If, if you can't see things for what they are, and that's where perception comes in, right, you're not going to respond to them appropriately. And that's where we get back to the avoidance, right? If you're not seeing the problem... You're not going to be able to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think getting back to the the farmer land model, um, yeah, the farmer has to put in work in order to, to tend to the land and nurture the land and allow the land to grow the way it needs to. But, again, can't control the land, right? You have to work with it. You have to understand it. And I think that, that um, you know, that model kind of brings, uh, brings to mind, um, I know, um, uh, Native Americans and in, in indigenous um you know, the indigenous people here, they kind of mastered the farming. I think I saw something, you know, they, they grew corn, beans, and, and squash, and, like, all three of them, like, you know, one nourished the land and helped the other one grow, like, the beans could grow on the corn stalk. The corn stalk provided a certain something. And it was, like, this this beautiful, like... Res hermanas. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, some beautiful sim- symbiosis, right? Like, this, <laughs> this, um, um, this harmony, right? And... You, you do, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta be able to see what's there, understand that you have no control over external, but how you act as the farmer or how you act as yourself, you have total control over that. Whether you water the crops or not, that's entirely within your control. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, at the very least, I, I perceived control because what I really want to agree with you on is just that um, when you said just how much a situation or an outlook can change based on like changing the wording of something, what could be an, what could be like, Oh, poor me, poor me could automatically just be changed into like, you know, Oh, am I, I I'm prepped for this. Like mm-hmm. I can, you know what I mean? And so like, I don't know. I think when, when you said the importance of how something is just worded alone, uh, it really, it made me feel a certain way. It, it's so important. It really is. I've changed. There's been. It's because it's it's of relevance in my personal life at the moment. Where there's been a couple situations that have been a little difficult to process. If you if you're kind of looking at them how they're traditionally looked at, mm-hmm. I like financial situations and stuff like that. Versus, um, I think the shift in the mindset has been now is just in in the situations that I'm regarding to. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more of it being one of the last perks that comes along. And just seeing it as that versus thinking it's not coming in. Yeah, it's not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, 
I, I guess I think we were starting to lean into something that was starting to hit home a little hard of recent times. So that's why I was just like, man, the importance of wording and just the importance of your outlook on things. And I think that's the closest thing to maybe control that we could have is just like, how are you going to approach it? Yeah. You know, how are you going to approach Because it's there and it's not going to go away. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, since we're on the topic, let's let's dive in, my friend. Um, so you said outlook, right? Which yeah. Is outlook. It's not out. It's not outside in. It's inside out. Right? Okay. It's, yeah. it's coming from within. And perception is everything. Perception is how you construct your reality, right? Is this, what fa- is this part of the stuff that fascinates you about the mind, by the way? Like this, the power of perception? Is, so you, you just hit on probably the most important part, especially of cognitive behavioral therapy. And again, it's a big umbrella. And there's very yeah. specific um, tenets of that. But um, so probably my favorite aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy is working on, I like to call it recalibrating or restructuring what we call your um, cognitive constructs. Mm-hmm. So again, we are a culmination. You sitting in that chair right now, you're a culmination of every experience you've ever had, right? For better, for worse, you have a frame of, of reference and understanding of who you are, what the world is, and, and who are others to you, amongst you, right? And when it comes to addressing the psychological dysfunction, it stems from perception. Because if you see it, like I said earlier, your body will feel it. And, and the part of your brain that creates these emotions can't tell the difference between what is and what it's being told. S- for the reason, like, we have nightmares, right? So we, in, you know, uh, we're around the same age, so you understand my Freddy Krueger references and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, the, the younger the younger generation doesn't, so I, I'd have to uh, modernize you got to wait for the remake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, so you're, you're asleep. You're dreaming. Freddy Krueger's chasing you, trying to kill you. You wake up, right? And and guess what's going on? Your your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight's activated. You sweating. Yeah, yeah, and you're going. So, where is Freddy Krueger? Where is that true threat? It doesn't exist. It's in your mind. It's a picture in your mind. It's a narrative in your mind. But your body is responding to it as if it was actually in front of you. And that's you know where we work on cognitive behavioral therapy. We use behaviors to rewire, reconstruct, recalibrate the cognition, your thoughts that are creating those unhelpful um, emotions. And w- when it comes to these unhelpful thoughts, that's kind of the easiest way to think about them, but they, they go by many names, right? Um, my favorite term for them is, is cognitive distortions, right? Um, patterns of unhelpful thinking, stuck points, um, you can, You're consistent with the helpful and unhelpful, I'm noticing. I try, I try yeah. to be, um, it's important. Yes, it is important to me. But even, um, I mean, further down, you, you get more in like uh, behavioralism and, and other areas where it's more research and academic. Um, you get into heuristics and and um, cognitive biases, right? And then in the philosophical realm, you get these um, logical fallacies. And then even oh. in the deep psychology, you get the defense mechanisms. Okay. The, what these are are all warped perspectives whether it's kind of ingrained or on the surface or at the core these are the tricks that the brain plays in order to protect itself that warps your vision of reality so instead of you know i i use the term i usually have my glasses on so you know you have your survival goggles on you see a saber-toothed tiger coming at you right but those are your survival goggles. They're going to see things in very extreme ways. And so you take off those survival glasses and it's a, a little kitten coming your way, right? But how, if a saber-toothed tiger was charging at you, I'm getting ready to drop kick, you know, that saber-toothed tiger in the face. And if that's your action, your behavior, and in reality you're drop kicking a poor little kitten, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to call, you know, uh, uh, the police on you for animal abuse, right, animal cruelty. And that's the problem. And, and that's the difference between... Um, what you what you perceive is not always what is and helping people remove those those glasses helping people remove those barriers to perceive reality because again those barriers exist because you're stuck in a survival mindset you have to have your survival goggles on you know when you experience that trauma it's those survival goggles that allowed you to survive that trauma Right when you're in a survival situation, when you are face to face with an actual, actual saber tooth tiger, you need those goggles. Yeah, they're important, right? 
But a lot of times, you know, we're, we're so quick to react because again, we don't want to re-experience that or we want to be a little proactive, but sometimes we're too quick to put on those goggles and it causes this unhelpful, unnecessary um, response that then creates a problem. So, you know, a, a very easy one, uh, an easy example, let's say, you know, you're standing in line at the grocery store and someone, cut, you know, walks in and cuts in front of you. You're quick to anger. You start yelling, you push the guy, right? The guy turns around and you realize, oh, he has a cane and he's blind. You, you didn't see the whole picture before you responded. You, you took the, the snippet of reality and, and processed it, and, and in your mind, you were creating this picture of someone was cutting you, someone was disrespecting you. You know, you can, go, you can go down the rabbit hole all you want, but in reality, that person just didn't recognize that you were there, and what amount of anger, what amount of aggression is going to solve that problem, right? And, and that's really what we work on is helping remove the boundaries, the, the misperceptions that are caused by these cognitive um, distortions. It's the term I prefer. Um, and, and once you address the perception, you respond realistically to the, the situation at hand. And when you respond to the actual situation, that's where you get the helpful emotions, right? Anger is very helpful if you need to defend yourself. Fear is very helpful if you need to run away. Sadness is very helpful if you have no outlet and just need to cry it out. But a lot of times, you know, what the, the, the most helpful response is a very neutral response. Oh, okay. You know, someone cut in front of me, like, obviously, hey, excuse me, sir, you know, there's a line here. I don't know if you, you know, notice. And you, and you solve the problem rather than and, and this problem did not require an emotional response to solve. It required that writer, that, that logical brain, right? Mm -hmm. But we're really quick to let this, uh, this amygdala, that animal brain go. And, and a lot of times it's because we have been conditioned or have been reinforced or just maybe ignorant to the, the workings of the mind and, and how emotions, you know, they're there to protect us, but man can, you know, in, in modern, modern life, do they, uh, they, can, they can cause a lot of problems as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'm understanding the primal and the human a little bit better, the rider and the elephant as mm -hmm. we talk about it more. And I want to ask if, because from what we've talked about, would you consider like professional athletes to be some of the best masters of like unleashing the primal versus the human? That's a very great segue. Um, so a little bit more about myself. I actually got into psychology to become a sports psychologist. Oh, okay, cool. So Hell yeah. um, I'm, I'm a former athlete, right? I, I did, you know, I was a three-sport athlete in high school. Yeah. I did pretty good for myself. Stack and, letterman. Huh? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you know, uh, swimming, track and field. Um, when I came back to, to UTEP, I was on their track team as well. Oh, nice. Um, got to complete, you know, Conference USA back, in, back when I was in. What were you uh, doing, like sprinting? I'll, Field? I'll give you another guess, yeah. Field? Shot put, discus, and hammer throw. <laughs> Ooh, I, was, I was a cool uh, 240 pounds, much much different uh, than my, my current weight. Stacked. But, you know, no neck. Yoked. Yeah, you know, 4,000 calories, 5,000 calories a day. A lot of protein shakes, man, man. And, and nothing but, but heavy squats and oh, deadlifts. But Hell it was yeah. a fun time. It took a lot of effort, but, you know, I, I was able to compete, even though I've, I've always been a very... Like naturally, like I, I consider myself a swimmer okay. innately, you know, uh, more, um, I'm, I'm built that way, but having to put on those extra pounds, um, you know, it, it was fun and necessary, but, you know, I had good technique and that's what let me, um, stay out of there. But understanding kind of being, you know, my, my dad was my coach for a lot, a majority of my adolescence. And so, you know, I was the coach's son and, and that comes yeah. with, you know, its own burdens, yeah, its course. own challenges. For sure, for sure. <laughs> Um, and then I was like, you know what, um, you know, when, when I finished up here at UTEP, uh, I was going to ship out, uh, out to San Francisco and, and initially I had applied for a sports psychology program out there. And, um, you know, two weeks before the, the semester started, I got a call and like, Hey, we're, we're dissolving our sports psychology program, but, uh, we have some availability in our, in our other, uh, you know, counseling psycho uh, psychology program, uh, program. And, if you wanna, if if you're willing, we can transfer you there. Like, All right, whatever. I, I just I just wanted to go to San Francisco and start grad school and get get uh, on board. But um, so when when it comes to athletes and and utilizing that that primal and, and human, um, this is this is really cool because I don't get to talk a lot about this. So I, I mentioned earlier, I, um, I'm a former special operations psychologist with the United States Air Force. Oh, there too, huh? Yeah. Um, 
that's what it's all about. And so when it comes to that, we're talking performance psychology. So whether it's sports, um, I've worked previously with like law enforcement, that type of mm -hmm. thing, um, and especially in the military, it's all about performance psychology. And the best way to think about it is, you know, in a traditional clinical setting, you're taking, let's say, someone with psychological dysfunction, right? Let's say depression, and my job is to make them feel better, right? Back to baseline balance, homeostasis. When it comes to performance psychology, I'm taking a baseline person and making them great, mm. right? And so you're using the same mechanisms, the same tricks to enhance their performance. Now it's really no soft approach, huh? It's, a little, it's like way more. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, but, but at the same time, you know, there's a limit, right? Yeah. And in the, it's the coach's job to push the athlete okay, to yes, the limit. Perfect. It's my job to help them expand the limit. And harness that power. Right? Yeah, harness it, but also, um, you know, the, the, the larger the tank, the more, you know, the, the water takes the shape of the glass type of thing. And so the, the more resilient, the bigger the tank I can help the, the athlete make. Um, and in this case, you know, uh, special operations, um, um, individuals, airmen, pilots, you know, you name it, uh, operators. Um, it was a very unique experience. And, and when it comes to understanding, yeah, these guys, they mess up, you know, their, their life is on the line and, and obviously other, many other people's lives on the lines. And so it, it is a high risk, um, and a situation and, and you have to be primed. And these guys, you know, already they go through so many tests, right? You know, I'm dealing with cream, cream of the crop. I'm, I'm sitting across some guy that's way smarter than me. You know, it's, it, let's use like a fighter pilot, for example smarter, more capable than I could ever wish to be, um, yet because of my, my knowledge and expertise, you know, in, in the psychological domain, I can contribute to that elevation. And it, it's not as different as you might think. It all come. we called it tactical breathing in uh, special operations because, you know, no macho guy wants to do belly breathing <laughs> <laughs> so we ha you know you put tactical in front of anything you know they'll buy into Our it game yeah yeah um but it's the same <laughs> mechanisms yeah. understanding understanding emotional regulation because uh, a lot of what you mentioned earlier um that animal brain so it's uh, I, I mentioned that the amygdala is that part of the brain that controls a lot of this um there's something called the amygdala hijack or the amygdala override and what happens is once it's activated, it basically shuts down your prefrontal cortex, the, the human part of your brain, which a lot of times when we're emotionally elevated, we're not thinking clearly, right? You know, if you've been in an argument maybe with a, a partner and it's like, oh, tell me one time, one time I've done that. And it's like, and you know there's like a million times that you could pull from if you could think, but you can't recall. So things like focus, concentration, memory, short-term, long-term memory recall, um, critical thinking, all that stuff goes out the window when we're emotionally elevated. And so what we're teaching these guys is how to regulate the emotions when operation is necessary, but at the same time, when the stuff hits the fan, you, you just got to survive and you do whatever it takes. And so being able to mitigate the two, but also you can't be an animal out there, right? We, innocent civilians, that kind of thing. Oh, yes. Okay. And, and you're, it's a very, very delicate, you know, fine line, a tight rope that you're walking. And so, you know, one minute you're, you're fighting for your life and the next minute, you know, you have to hold back because, you know, it, it's whatever pops out from behind the corner yeah, is, isn't the end. Or some, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it, it's the same principles, just in a different domain. Um, but the mechanisms are the same. Is it fair to say, though, but having that em environmental awareness, knowing it's not really f that far fetched for the kid maybe to have some shit on him that's going to fuck, fuck us back up? You know what I mean? So it's always a possibility. Um, it's just know, all about I, that. When I know it, it has happened. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, mistakes happen on both ends. Yeah, yeah. On, you know, on, on one end, not to get too political, right? Oh, yeah. But, um, mistakes are made. And, and But sometimes, you know, you, you empathize and, and then also, yeah. you know, your teammate dies because the situation maybe yeah. that kid did have Just to, to double happen. down on, like, how much of a tightrope it is. Oh, it's extraordinary, it. an extraordinary tightrope. And that's why I, I developed a lot of... Um, personal respect for the, for the people that do that kind of thing yeah you know regardless politically like i think on an individual level we you know, again I'm, I'm all about kind of losing the labels losing yeah, the yeah. barriers we're humans at the end of the day and you know i think it, it gets back to a lot of that um that farmer farmer land thing you know find finding your flock finding your herd finding your people right because individual you know we're one you know, you get control of the self, right? But you lose the resources of the many. And, and again, that's kind of a similar fine line and it mm -hmm. applies in uh, operations as well. You got your, you know, your, your team, right? And you got to trust them wholeheartedly. And 
um, at the same time, you don't want to, uh, uh, you, you won't have control on what they do. You just got to develop that trust. And, and I, you know, as, as me, I'm a big believer in collectivism rather than individualism. And I think, you know, you mentioned earlier the sanctum and, and, and what we do there. And it, and it kind of feeds right into that. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to do it all yourself. Yeah. You, you find your people, you find, you find your flock, um, the like minds, and, and that's where the magic happens, right? You know, the, the synergy, uh, if you will, that exponential growth, you can push each other, you can, you know, the, the, the sum of the parts are greater than, than the whole, and I think that's the saying. Um, like that. And it's true, and I think, you know, that's something that is very, very um, necessary in the operational domain, the performance domain, because, you know, you have to you have to develop that and, and the things you can achieve as as the collective far exceeds what you can do as an individual oh yeah so kind of tying those two together that's that's what we got uh, you know this the sanctum going for and stuff like that <laughs> that's good that creative synergy yes, sir. um quick sidebar because uh we, we've been talking about the uh amygdala and um i i the amygdala the amygdala there you go Amygdala, f- folks. But I saw, I think, I, once again, a tweet reference. And it was just a humorous joke. And it was just funny. It was just like a realization. Somebody saying that uh, they came across a person who just seemed to always be doing, like, weird, wild things. And it turned out that they did a test on them. And it turned out that there was some damage back there that, like, no recept, no, like, the amygdala was not getting any receptors or anything. And as a result, this person always seemed to be, like, like a fearless dude. Mm-hmm. Um, are you fascinated or hear about any stories like that where like there's some sort of like actual like damage done to this part of the brain where it does affect like their sense of um, danger? Yeah, I, 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 I'm just, I'm always fascinated by deviations, right? Outliers, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, maybe not necessarily damage. Maybe they were just born with yeah, it, just no, not no. firing up. Regardless of the means of, of the, you know, of why it's not firing or yeah, the yeah. deviation, right? I, I, I find that all that fascinating. Um, is that true, though, or was I reading some bullshit? I believe, the, and uh, I don't want to be quoted on this, but I'm going to give it my best shot. I believe there's a term, I think it's called ataraxia, where, like, a human does have uh, the complete lack of fear. Yeah. Or, like, a lack of emotional elevation. Uh-huh. Um, and is it because... I, I, don't have a, I don't have Google in front of me to double check, but, um, but yeah, no, you, there are deviations, there are mutations, there are outliers always... And, um, you know, again, it could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, mm-hmm. right? It's how you use it, I suppose, or how it affects you really at the end of the day. Because, mm-hmm. um, again, you know, uh, similar to that is um, I, did a, I did a really fun class, like biological bases of psychology or something like that, or behavioralism. And, you know, we did something silly with taste buds, okay? And, like, there are people, you know, I love, you know, uh, I'm going to consider myself somewhat of a foodie, and that's my self-care. Take myself out to our local restaurants here. But there are, you know, super tasters, people that can, you know, um, like pick up the essence of, you know, and then like a glass of wine and the notes. like that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Which is, you know, cool. And, and there's actually a, an evolutionary reason for that, right? Because they were highly sensitive to, like, toxins and in certain things. They could they could either sniff or, or taste bad stuff, and that was really important. Um and, you know, where I fell on the spectrum of this, apparently I was on the complete opposite end. Like, you know, there's, the test you do is you kind of drop these little uh, chemicals on your tongue and you, you go up in scale and they're in bitterness. And, like, oh. the sooner you realize the bitterness, like, the more delicate your taste buds are. Apparently, apparently I'm, I'm scorched there, man, because I, I, I got to the last one and I'm like, no, this is fine, guys. Uh, but, but, again, it's evolutionary, right? So my mutation or my, my innate... Um, lack of uh, of taste um you know I'd, if i ate the wrong thing i'd probably you know oh yeah it's to come to the poison to like how however much? i would never go hungry because you know if uh, it was just not good tasting and still edible i i you know you know caveman me would be all right and i, I you know it'd be a delicacy and i think of like the office reference or i think creed they they're doing like a prank and they put a an onion where he's eating an apple and they replace it to see if he notices the difference and he just eats the eats the onion anyways like it was the apple and mm-hmm. that would be me. It's wild. <laughs> I actually saw a video of a camel who walked up and ate a, a cactus, like a little ball of a cactus, oh. and then it ate a lemon and immediately reacted to the lemon. 
course, everyone's reaction was like, how are you going to react to a lemon but not a cactus? But obviously, yeah. these things are prepped. We're built, yeah, we're something. built differently. And, and, I th yeah. and again, I think it gets back to the uniqueness of every human, right? Like there's a, someone comes into your office and they, you know, they have complete amygdala disengagement. That's, that's fascinating. That's going to really make me work for my money that day because, you know, <laughs> a, a lot of what I do, again, it's, it's a wide net, but the art of therapy is tailoring it to the individual. And, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think all that stuff. And uh, outliers are fascinating because, you know, I think from, uh, I think, an evolutionary perspective, and, you know, there is a theoretical orientation, evolutionary psychology, where a lot of the earlier stuff and understanding of this comes from, um, I mean, you know, if, if you're a fan of the X-Men comics, like it's kind of the next phase, man. We're, we're all, we all have certain mutations one way or the other, adaptation, Darwinism, survival of the fittest, you name it, it's, it's all about survival, you know. The, the ones of us that mutate to adjust will survive, the ones that don't, don't. Mm -hmm. um, and some people just are a little, kind of take a couple hundred thousand years leap uh, just randomly because of, you know, what's, you know, if they're born that way or... Yeah. Uh, what not and uh, yeah it's 100 percent fascinating but you know i i don't get to research it research it much i definitely get to work with it as much but um you know it's it is it is uh definitely personally uh, i i do enjoy those uh, yeah. articles when when they come around for sure oh man that's crazy like whether it's whether it came from it's more fascinating to know if someone was just maybe born without that just firing up or anything like that but yeah i want i i I, at the very tail end of that, I did start getting very uh, curious just thinking about, like, what could possibly the next steps of evolution be? Because I feel like a lot of them in our, in, out of humans are going to be very um, t uh, technology-based, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe our eyesight's just going to be more attuned to it. That'll yeah. be, like, a small-scale version of how we evolve as humans. And then uh, it's interesting to think the larger futuristic-sounding evolutions that we'll probably undertake, like, the first time we start maybe getting born with these neural links in us because we started to finally adapt them or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. There's really... Well, weird we, we've, I think we're already... We've discovered the first evolution. Um, I think if you Google, like, um, smartphone pinky. Oh, it's got a dent. That? Yeah, it has oh, that yeah. dent. Uh, so, I mean, you know... It's, it's one thing to have it get developed over time, but to uh, be born, to be born with it. it. But that's how it starts, Whoa. right? So if, you, if you study evolution or... or um, uh, it makes me just want to, like, not do that. Yeah, well, so I, I want to go against. I'm very, it. Uh, very conscious about not trying to do it. How about Bluetooth? Are you one who like tries to avoid Bluetooth as often as you can? No, uh, I. How do I say it? I, like, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for the old school. So like wires, I need wires. Okay. Like, I have like Bluetooth headphones for like when I work work out, but. Mechanical. Yeah, like if I'm sitting at home, you know, enjoying some whiskey with my music, it, it's going to be very much wired because I just or trust the or wire. even vinyl. Oh yeah, oh, I, I'm I, I do have you know I do love the the vinyl, but um, there's something I, I need that actual connection. Um, but no, I, I don't fear Bluetooth uh, that that kind of stuff. Um, I use it. Uh, I, I just I think it's a personal bias. I think the good old wire headsets are work better <laughs> i'd like to use your experience and your um indulgence in music books movies art um do you kind of see this as your own makeshift form of belly breathing this is what helps reset you it's what help restabilize you is there ways is that fair for humans to find their own versions of belly breathing along with adding it into yeah. their regime so that is uh, you're Got the good questions, man. This is good. Live at MFHQ, baby. <laughs> uh, no, man. Um, but it, but it's important because what you're talking about is self care. Yes. And that's another pop psychology oh, yes, term. Yes, yes, self care. It, was, it is. Um, you cannot self care your way out of psychological dysfunction. However, self care is a very important component of it. Maybe for the maintenance stage as well. For I think the total stage. Okay. Right. Um, so this is where we get into kind of the, the aspects of, of what's the difference between therapy and, and advice giving, right? A lot of times like, oh, what's it like to get paid to give people advice? I'm like, I, 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 don't, I don't give advice. Trust me, you, you, you don't want my advice. It's not great. You, you want my analysis and psychological, um, psychological intervention, right? Because you come to me and you're having a stressful day, you know, okay, my advice is do what I do because it works for me. 
I, after a hard day, um, I typically go to the UTEP pool and I swim laps for about an hour and then I feel much better afterwards, right? And then I go home, pour a little glass of, of whiskey, like I said, sit in my chair, listen to my music and, and life is good. But, you know, if, if someone's battling alcoholism and then my s advice is to s sip and drink whiskey, that's problematic. Yes. And so, so again, you know, the therapeutic process is not advice giving, it's, it's, it's not letting you vent. Um, it is a very tailored, methodical, and, and, and um, evidence-based approach to treat these things. But, but self-care is, is very important, and, and it's part of um, the interventions that I, I perform. Okay, what makes you happy? What are the things that you enjoy? What is your process of self-care? And most people don't have a process, which is, you know, unfortunate because, you know, me, I, I'm... You know, I just mentioned earlier, you got to enjoy the little things, yeah. right? If, if, if you're living... Enjoy it, right? And, and that's where, you know, I think, you know, I, I attribute a lot of my, my own self-care. Um, it, it really does, it, it, it is food, um, you know, good, good drinks, wine, um, a whiskey, uh, books for sure. And that's something I've been proud of myself. That was kind of my New Year, New You goal is to read more. And I've been pretty successful with oh, that. Oh, this is because, something pretty new. Yeah, because... Um, you know, going through as much school as I did, you kind of become very jaded when it comes uh, to reading because I had to, not, I didn't get to read for fun. Yeah. I had to read because it was required because I was going to be tested on it because these are things I had to know. And so there was a time where, you know, I, I go to the bookstore here um, and, you know, I, I buy a book and then it sits on my shelf and then, you know, before I know it, I got like 20 books piled up. I'm like, ah, like, what's the point of buying them if I haven't read them yet? And, um, you know, that, that, that is something that, you know, personally for myself, I've been intentional in trying to Im Im incorporate and improve. Um, what are some of the things that you've done to prime your environment to read to read more often? Other than time management. Guess, okay. Time management. Um, you know, it's, we, I tell my patients this all the time. We wake up every day and we got 24 hours. That's all you get. You're not going to find the time to read. There's no more time to find. You get 24 hours. And so getting very structured, very regimented, intentional with the time that you do have. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the 888 model. Eight hours of rest, eight hours of work, eight hours of play. All right. So in reality, you know, I, I you know, got the old nine to five, so I do work for eight hours. Um, I, you know, I do need eight hours of sleep in order to be maximum you know f function at a at my maximum level so that leaves for me the eight hours of, of play and so you know um making sure i prioritize and, and strategize um and you know i got dad responsibilities partner responsibilities family you know my 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 mother my brother um, creative projects yeah it, it's very easy to fill your time with other things yeah and if you're not intentional with your time you know it's kind of like that that empty em any empty uh vessel will be filled oh, right? and the next thing you know uh -huh. damn there was no time to work out exactly Shh. exactly so being intentional with your time is one um and and rewarding yourself right yeah um I, I i i'm kind of a sucker for chocolate that's my vice and so you know um putting the reward after right you kind of do the thing like it motivates you all right well i'll knock out 10 pages i'll knock out a chapter and then i'll i'll go enjoy my little you know, Dove Dark Chocolate Square, you know, that kind of thing. Just dumb little things like that. That's what we call, those are the behavioral prosthetics. Those are the things that you put. This is the boss and employee. This is the risk yeah. and pun this is reward and punishment. Well, I mean, it's, but it's an important part, right? Yeah. Because um, that's where we get into kind of behavioralism, right? Classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and that's really where, you know, the fundamentals, you know, Pavlov's dog, you ring a bell and you salivate, all that stuff you learned in Psych 101. Um, uh it is, it is a good way to entice the elephant to move a little bit. Uh, um, and if you put that chocolate in the right place, he's going to move exactly where you want to. So um, it, it is. It's in their silly little tricks and their things that I would have never learned unless I, I you know, th this was stuff I learned in my residency. It was even after my education. This is stuff I learned in the field, you know, as, as you train to, to be licensed and, and things like that. And, you know, and that's why, like, a lot of times I, I, I never blame anyone for being in the situation they're in. I never judge one of my patients for what they do or how they do it because, you know, like, I, I wouldn't know any better if I, if I hadn't gone through this process either. And I'm just grateful they're there and they're, you know, 
willing and, and, and wanting my help and, and, and trusting me to provide that for them. So, you know, I, I try to practice what I preach as much as possible, but, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, if I did listen to everything that I knew, I'd, I'd live the perfect existence. And, you know, I, I'm, yeah, I fall short more often than not. <laughs> Especially with the dove chocolates. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, man, I, I really appreciate, I know that you mentioned like good questions, but like great answers, like being able to string along certain like, key points to tie it all around like the, the just being able to use the rider and the elephant the whole way through has really helped me understand how all of this is like it all just works together in harmony rather than just being these isolated things that like you have to know which pieces of the puzzle to put all oh, the triangle goes in the triangle spot like it's not really like that oh yeah i you wish know? it was that easy yeah, i yeah. wish it was that easy but, in, but again, being able that's to the see importance. the yeah the common like how it all tr traces you know oh, yeah. the fact that you could use the same model throughout the entire conversation mm -hmm. i did I want to end off on like one more and I want to go ahead and just dive into the, the idea that sometimes the, the, these disorders, these cognitive um, distortions, mm -hmm. they occur naturally, you know, whether it's through like lengthy experiences or just that, that the, the environment that they're in, that like that tightrope. Um, but I did want to dive into when these are stemming from substances okay uh what are you what's your experience like with patients and like your understanding of what's the how does the experience when it's substance related differ from when it's a, not so easy to pinpoint it on you know yeah another another very deep question uh give me a second um so let's 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 start simple and, and, and get a little more complex and so okay why does one resort to substance? Let's Sometimes use, it's prescribed. Yes, uh, very true. Um, so let's let's use kind of a common one, right? I already mentioned um, alcohol as a depressant, and you know a lot of time, or the reason it becomes helpful in certain situations, let's say social anxiety, uh, it depresses the part of your brain associated with social inhibition and many other things. Um, substances just like anything done in moderation can be helpful. Again, I, I am a sucker for substances. I love my red wine, I love my whiskey, I love my chocolate, mm -hmm. right? But there's a balance, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's toxicity, you know, in the buzzwords of pop psychology, toxic masculinity, right? So it's, yeah, there's, there's a, there is a balance, like, you know, masculinity is important in all people, but there's a, there's a range where it gets a little too much. But same water toxicity, man. Like, you drink too much water, you can die. Yeah. Like, most yeah, people yeah. don't know that. I believe it's three liters within a certain amount of time. Yeah, you, you basically wash out everything. And, and so you can, water can be toxic if you drink too much of it. So too much of anything is bad. Mm -hmm. Not enough of other stuff is bad. And so when we talk substances, we have to understand the why. Okay, so why is someone resorting to alcohol? Let's say an alcoholism. Um, one, pretty easy, accessible, right? Two, I mean, in, in this case, what we're drinking now, it's delicious, right? So, and, and three, it makes you feel better. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We wouldn't drink it if it didn't work, and it works. The problem psychologically is that people often use alcohol to cope through avoidance. The more you drink, the less you feel. So we don't want to feel these things. So oh, you can either, you know, go through a couple months of psychotherapy and resolve it, or you can get drunk that night and not have to deal with it today and just save it for tomorrow. But the thing with alcohol, tolerance. In order to forget as much as you forgot tonight, you're going to have to drink just a little more tomorrow to get to that same amount of avoidance, right? And that's where we find that it takes more and more and more to be able to cope or self-medicate, really, is what we're doing. Um, and that's where things become problematic because then you have health issues, right? Liver issues, DUIs, drunk driving, um, you know... Um, partner issues, family issues, violence, you know, when, when we have less social inhibition, we also have less emotional regulation and control. So, and, and again, it, it's all about the balance, right? I, I use whiskey sometimes to just kind of unwind at the end of the day, right? Not to escape an issue though, right? Correct. And that, that's 
you're listening. Good job. <laughs> yeah, no. Avoidance is key here. Understanding we are programmed to avoid to the whole fight or flight. Mm. You cannot solve a problem if you're constantly avoiding it. And so, yes, um, you know, for me, a glass of red wine, I will, I rarely eat a steak without red wine, right? Yeah. Um, because it makes it better, right? But I don't drown myself in a bottle of wine to try to de-stress, right? Um, and that, that's really the important thing is understanding why you're drinking, right? For enjoyment, recreation, social fun, um, or avoidance, and then understanding, you know, you, the tolerance and knowing when to stop. And, and it's hard. There are some people that cannot do that because there is, you know, there is a chemical response. There is a, an emotional response. There is a reason people do it. And, you know, recently I saw a meme that's like, you know, it, it's hard being a psychologist because you can't, you can never get mad at anything or judge anyone because you just know why they are the way they are. And that's the, that's the name of the game. My, under, my job is to teach, uh, to get to the whys. Why do you drink? Why do you run from your emotions? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And so, you know, I think in getting a little deeper into your question, I mean, we, we all self-medicate, right? I mean, sugar is self-medication, drugs are self-medication, alcohol is self-medication, um, but doing it in a way that's responsible and helpful rather than unhelpful. Yeah. I read, a, I read through the Alcoholics Anonymous book, and there's a point where it tells you it's not so much that alcohol is bad, it's that you have an unhealthy relationship with it. And I think they're trying to say, like, it's it, like, dude, if you look to your left and right, there's people that, like, can handle the shit. So it's not so much that it's bad. It's just that, like, your personal experience. Yeah. And I think that goes back to my bicycle reference earlier. Like, you know, maybe, um, you know, let's say someone built, like, let's say my daughter, right? I mean, a bicycle hitting her, whether she sees it coming or not, is going to have a different impact on her because she's oh, yeah. a different human. She's built differently. And that's kind of the, you know, everyone's different. So everyone's going to have a different experience, different tolerances, different abilities to regulate and not. And, and, and that's why, you know, I mentioned earlier, like I had the art of therapy is taking all I know and formatting it to that specific patient in a way that's going to be helpful to them because again if i just sit there and say don't be anxious or just go swim it off you'll be fine right like that's not that's not helpful to anyone and it does come down to the individual and, and again it, it gets to that whole you know you're the only one that can save yourself right and my job is just to kind of help you figure out how yeah i mean how do you um after your time with patients are done is there a certain like grading scale on your own end that kind of helps you determine whether it was a proper send-off into their maintenance stages or do you kind of just have to like you said earlier just put that trust into the patient and know that you know they're gonna they're gonna take what they what they got well i mean you know it's personally i i don't take it much of it home right like i I do my best with every patient I have, and that's all the control that I have, right? Mm -hmm. um, is to give them my best. I can't control what they do once they leave my office. I hope for the best always. I always hope for the best. But, you know, there's patient, patients that come back, you know, days, weeks, months, years mm -hmm. later, and it's like, hey, I'm glad you remembered. I'm glad you're back here. I'm glad you're ready to work. And, yeah, they might have forgotten everything I taught them, and so we just start all over again. Um, but there is no real measure so to speak i do you know i do have those moments where it's like ah i did it like yes this was a good um protocol this patient is better they don't need me anymore they are ready to you know we call it termination we terminate with with mm -hmm. them and you know there, there have been times like you know I'd, I'd be at a park and i see a patient that was you know you know inches away from you know a very dark place and then I see them at a park with their friends just having such a good time, you know, months, years later after I had worked with them. And that's very rewarding, you know. Um, there, are, there are mechanisms, again, the feedback-informed care, being able to kind of rate or get ratings afterwards of like, okay, what do you think of your therapist? Was it helpful? What would you change? And I think, you know, I think we all should engage in feedback-informed uh, or feedback information and, and 
all domains. You know, um, the evidence shows that we are never as good as we believe we are uh, in reality. Um, uh, the research continually shows if, if an individual rates how good they are on a scale, it's always much higher than it actually is. So that's, that's a very humbling statistic. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good old statistics. It's uh, the, the bell curve. We all, we're all pretty much in the middle there, unless we're a true outlier. But, you know, that's like the LeBrons, Einsteins, Hawkings of the world. Um, I'm all right. I'm all right being in the middle. I'm, I'm okay with it. And I think it's accountability is really important. But... It, I am comfortable with with who I am and what I do, and, and I know I give my best efforts. And I know it's not always the case, right? I have Everyone has off days. Um, but you learn from them, and, and, and you try to do better the next day. And uh, so, yeah, I, I wish, you know, I, they gave me, like, gold stars or something to show me how effective I am, but they don't. <laughs> and then, okay, so... Just to close off official form formally is I, because I am appreciative that we get to talk about this because one of the questions David had asked earlier was, you know, and and your uh, how can you just kind of tell if they're being honest with you, and you know you explained like you just kind of got to put the trust in why would they be coming back if they didn't have the at least the attention, mm -hmm. to be honest, and that was always one of my biggest um, gripes with it is not so much that because I've tried it. I've tried not so much um, in the form of like psychotherapy, but it was more, I think, what what was along the lines of cognitive. Mm -hmm. And so my experience with that and a lot of where a lot of my criticisms had lied through my experience, at least, was, um, yo, I mean, I guess I appreciate them giving me the benefit of the doubt, but we're over here having a conversation and, and like truthfully and maybe I feel more, I feel maybe very self-aware in this moment, but all they're getting is my side of the story. So like, how can we ever make progress if they're not giving me a proper analysis based on like what my company around me, like my surrounding people are saying about me, because if it gets that percent, it's that warped perception, it's that cognitive distortion. But I'm also feeling like that cognitive distortion might also translate at, as like the patient is providing the, the professional that cognitive their distortion account, and yeah. that's all they're being given to run with so yeah and and so it's it's a good question um and there is an answer for this time so yes it's a very easy answer so the answer is your perception at all is all that matters if you are the one in that room i'm treating you okay and yeah. and you know i i tell my patients this all the time because most of them come in with you know secondary tertiary problem so let's say you know their anger or their depression or their anxiety is impacting their relationship negatively um you have to get your your own ducks in a row before you can get the relationship ducks in a row because if you try to treat a relationship or like let's say couples therapy right um again you you can be the even if you were the perfect person they could still think exactly what they think of you let's say in your your circle whatever the issue is they can still think that even if you were perfect and so I, you know, with other patients, collateral information can be helpful, but I've never found it necessary. That's a good word. Okay, I completely get that word. I, I never, I had never called it collateral information. Yeah, yeah. And um, because I'm not treating that external, that, that collateral um, resource, I'm not, um, I'm, not prov I'm not treating their version of you. I'm treating you, you, right? And so it's not necessary. And, and when it comes to, you know, we get into the realm of like absolute objectivity, right? The, the true you, so to speak. Um, no one can tell you who you are. That's something you have to discover for yourself. And when you get back to that's, that's my job. And then, then the things you learn, you can start influencing your environment. It's kind of like a, a game of chess in, in life, right? If you move a piece on a board and let's say your opponent, you know, you have a plan, a game plan, and your opponent moves a piece you weren't expecting, you have to alter your game plan. Same things happen. When you resolve your own dysfunction, we call it kind of the intrapersonal dysfunction, you can start addressing the interpersonal dysfunction. So intr uh, dysfunction within yourself will create dysfunction, like a dysfunctional dynamic between you, let's say, your partner, or your family. And, and, you know, that's where we get into, like, family systems therapy and couples therapy, yeah. which is a whole, again, a whole other layer, a whole other iceberg to conquer. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But as far as um, when you resolve your dysfunction, you are changing a piece on the board that can influence change in the environmental dysfunction. And that's, you know, kind of the next level of what I talk to my patients about is, you know, you're not completely at the will of, um, you know, the external and having zero control. Sure, we don't have control, but we can create influence and we can alter change. We can create change even though we may not have control. And I think that's, um, that's something that people, it, it takes them a while to understand through seeing that if, if you treat yourself, you, I mean, subsequently treat the environment. Eh. <laughs> Just. That's good, man. I appreciate it a lot. I have my open-mindedness to psychology and the idea of how the mind works, but I have had my strict opinions and my sharp opinions on, like, going and people just weekly telling, like, like weekly as in W-E-A-K, like, like cop out, almost just telling people as if that's the one and only solution, you know what I mean? So it's created some, like, negative um, biases for me, but I feel like we broke through a lot of those, just getting to, like, talk about your honest perception of yeah. how you do see a patient and what your experience is. But I, I understand that you're not speaking on behalf of everyone. Well, no. Everyone in the profession. I, well, I do understand that there's, you know. I, you know, and I think to your credit, just like any field, yeah, there's, and there's good and bad, course, man. Uh, and there's I, the I heard horror story and the unhealthy, <laughs> helpful, but yeah, oh, helpful, <laughs> helpful and the unhelpful. No, but I mean, you know, I, I've had patients come back after I, I sent them off to a therapist, and I was like, they told you what? Man, yeah. So I mean, it's there, and 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 you know, it's an important thing of. Um, the number one factor in good treatment outcomes is what we call the therapeutic rapport. It doesn't matter level of education, age, gender, theoretical orientation, techniques. The number one factor in treatment outcomes is the therapeutic rapport, the genuine relationship that you develop with your therapist. And so yeah. that's why I tell my patients. Um, that's when you really start unlocking. Oh, find your the therapist yeah. that you get. You know, find find your flock, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And that's 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 the most important. It rings. It hits harder when you get to when somebody says it after a two hour conversation versus when somebody just tries to say it the first go around. So I really do appreciate the conversation, man. Like I, I think we learned a lot about how just behavior works and all the things that really go into it because it's it's a lot more. I mean, it already seems like it's such a big world, but getting to be able to like break it down really does help you like just digest it a lot better. Absolutely. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Like I said, this is kind of what I want to, to do and hope to do in the future. And again, purely educational, right? Do your own research, get your own treatment, but uh, happy to always discuss and, and get these conversations going um, because we, you know, we need to change. We need to expose um, or get exposure and, and build that, that worldly knowledge and kind of get back to, you know, helping each other out, being humans, doing what humans do and just, just trying to survive and, and, and thrive a little bit in the, in the journey. Yeah. In the 2030s, Justin, it's going to be there. There's going to be like a nationwide program, like D.A.R.E., that just goes all about. <laughs> I'm down, man. Let's make it happen. <laughs> hey, um, is there anything that you'd like to plug for the episode? I'm not much of a plugger. Um, I don't know who 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 should we mention. Um, I mean, you know, the, the sanctum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the, I I love the space that we were able to do there. What's the status of it at the moment? Is it a creative hub at the moment? Is it still available for rent? So we originally like. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of a long story. I don't know how much more time we got, but uh, <laughs> um, you know. It became a very special place, a, a creative hub. Kind of, I like to think of it kind of like an echo chamber or a think tank. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard you say that. Before. And, you know, we, we were trying to make a little extra money doing Airbnb, making it nice. But we, we pulled it off Airbnb just because um, uh, Nancy with her, her plant shop, you know, shout out to La Planta. Um, and, uh, you know, me with my work, um, we realized eh, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, but being able to create a space and have a space, you know, and then you're, you're one of our, our favorite utilizers of the space, um, you know, to really bring people together. And, and you know, it's my journey and finding my flock and, yeah. and being able to to be part of, of like-minded individuals that want to create things and make life, you know, a little more beautiful. 
uh, a little more entertaining, a little more, uh, a little more fun. Um, you know, I think that's going to be the goal. Um, we got a couple more renovations, small time things, but then I really think, you know, we, we want to maybe host some regular get togethers and, you know, you can call them parties if you want kickbacks, even soirees, hey. soirees. Yeah. I think it's a little more sophisticated sessions. Let's see. Yeah. Let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, um, we want to get more people involved. Um, we've already had a lot of, of great people come yeah, through and homework. utilize the space. Yeah. And I mean, we, we don't want it to stop. We, you know, um, I think the creative scene of El Paso, of, you know, lifelong El Paso and myself, and it's at a peak right now. And I, I think I just want to be part of, you know, do my part because, you know, as someone who wishes they were creative, uh, you know, I, I still I still want to do my part and be able to um, support the the creative scene and and have a place where people can get together, utilize and and you know kind of help that advancement. So yeah. to speak. Ah, oh, well, we appreciate your contributions, man. It's a great spot, and what you guys do with it is, it's good. It's good for the community, especially for people who just have an idea but don't necessarily have that like location. Locations, I think, are one of the hardest things for creatives to find in El Paso, and. I'm glad that you guys are able to find that contribution and provide that space. Anytime, man. We'll plug the sanctum. <laughs> we'll plug it up. Um, but uh, one more thank you. And, hey, man, that's how we do it over here at the HQ, boy. Legends only in the building. Uh, make sure that you guys, of course, man, support the channel. All of our platforms, YouTube. Instagram, Spotify, Apple Pod, Amazon Music. Of course, you can go ahead and find everything at mfpearl.com. Um, but, I mean, as long as you guys are showing love, then we're always growing. So just as long as you guys do that, we're always happy. But you know what it is. MF Pearl, Justin Keppel, Volume 2, live at MFHQ. Yeah.